Good evening. Um, I'd like to welcome you to the school committee business meeting of Monday, February 4th. Um, I'm greeting you because the mayor is not here. Um, I haven't heard whether or not she's going to be here, but many of you may know that her father passed away last, uh, late last week. So I know that there's wake and funeral coming up, and I don't, I don't know whether she's going to be here or not. So we'll just, we'll just get started. Mrs. Kennedy, could you call the roll? Yes. Mr. DeCanter? Here. Mr. Cole? Here. Mr. Menon? Here. Mayor Holliday is absent. Mr. Hawkeiser? Here. Mr. Reardon? Here. Mr. Callahan? Here. One absent. Terrific. If we could stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, Thank you. Um, I had the um, sorry, comment. Yeah, um, we'd like to do a session of public comment at this point. Um, if you could uh, join us at the microphone. Um, if you have something that you would like to share with us, um, I would each ask you to identify uh, yourself by name and your address so that we can get it into the record. And uh, if you could keep it within two minutes. Usually this is, uh, this is a time for the school committee to listen, um, so we're happy to do that. I am Jamie Roosevelt, 17 Collins Street. I have twins in the first grade. I'm here to talk about the school schedule for next year. Um, I am actually in favor of free um, Labor Day start and uh, Friday half days. Mainly my rationale on free Labor Day start is we are a family of two working full-time parents who already have to cobbled together February vacation, April vacation, Christmas vacation, which will be about 10 days this year. Um, and then adding the fact that, thank God, we haven't had any snow days yet. We could be, potentially be out the 12th. And most camps don't start until the 24th of June. And then if we start after Labor Day, that's adding another about a week and a half of cobbling together things or more expenditures for working families. And it gets expensive. I don't want to be pouring all my money into camps. I would love to be at the beach with my kids, but I don't have a limited vacation time. And if I want to excel in my career and show my kids good work ethics, I can't just keep on you know, not showing up for work and depleting all my vacation time. Like, I spend time with my family. We do things through the summer. That three days before Labor Day is not going to kill the kids. It's, they want to get back to school. They want to be with their friends. They want to get in the swing of things. And especially with kids with a little bit of anxiety about the school year, it gets them in that motion. So I know it may not be a popular um, stance, but that's my stance. That's our family's stance. And it's been positive for us. And also, I know I'm wrapping up, but we started kindergarten last year, and that was post Labor Day because of the nature of kindergarten. And it was a struggle at the end to get them past post Labor Day. So I just ask for your consideration for that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Christine Doherty, and uh, I live at 13 Precious Street. Um, I had a couple of different comments. Um, the first one is a few rounds of um, appreciation. I wanted to thank the uh, superintendent and the athletic director and the principal of the high school um, for attending um, the recent uh, swim meet for the co-op team. My daughter swims on the co-op team, and sometimes the co-op teams are a little bit forgotten. And it was really nice um, to see uh, the leadership of the school there at one of their recent meets. So I wanted to say a big thank you for that. Um, I also wanted to thank um, Mr. Wolf for his continued efforts at um, robust communication. It's been really wonderful um, to get his weekly messages. Uh, it's been um, very informative, but also, you know, sort of creating a, a stronger sense of community, and I think that's important. I also wanted to thank Mr. Testa and uh, Mr. Wolf for establishing um, or about to establish the climate committee at the high school. 
I think that that was a brilliant idea, um, both to uh, elevate student voices, but also to um, pay some attention to some serious issues uh, that could be prioritized up there. As you may know, the first one they're going to try to tackle is in regards to vaping. And along those lines, I would like to um, urge the committee to listen to whatever reporting comes out of that committee or other committees about the serious nature of vaping at the high school. I know it's also serious at the middle school. I have an eighth grader. Um, but uh, as you begin to look for look toward the budget, um, I would like to encourage the committee to consider seriously any recommendations that um, relate to funding vaping prevention, whether that be staffing for monitors or whatever uh, other ideas might come out of that committee. I also wanted to talk briefly about uh, start later efforts. Now, again, um, I would like to uh, mention that our family is strongly in support of um, some more due diligence regarding that and moving that issue forward in our district. And I would also like to speak to the calendar. Um, I um, would be in favor, as our previous speaker said, of a Friday early releases. I saw that some of the calendar discussions were revisiting Thursdays, and I would like to um, put my two cents in that I think that the, thurs the Fridays have been very successful regarding uh, pre or post Labor Day. I'm kind of mixed on that. I would mean uh, post Labor Day. We've had several uh, pre Labor Day starts. Um, but um, I do also honor the experiences of other families, like our previous speaker. Uh, but I would certainly like to have us not go back to Thursday half days. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Christine, Great, terrific. Thank you. Hi, good evening. My name is Bianca Reed Miller. I have a daughter that's a senior at the Newport Port High School and another that's 13 going to the fall of the school. I'm here because I'm in favor of the school starting late. I have um, proof that my other daughter goes to the IC, starts at age 20, and I can see the difference in the morning, a healthy breakfast, more awake, and that's a part. Our teenagers belong to a generation that's under a lot of pressure. Issues like depression, anxiety, drugs addiction, bullying, social pressure to succeed academic life, overworked, we all know that. And in case, in our case, in our state, lack of sleeping. Um, I just Google a little bit uh, and I found an article about Newbury Court about this issue from 2015. And we're still talking about this. I think we all agree that there is a problem. Uh, the goal here is to improve the life, academic life of our kids. And I think that we know the solution. I know that will be difficult, a lot of talking, a lot of strategy, logistic, but it is possible. And the community will be here to help and put our heads together to find a solution. I know that many states already apply that. The school starts late. I'm very proud of our Massachusetts. We are pioneers in so many issues, but we are a little behind. But by sure, we're not going to be the first but I hope that you're not going to be the last state to apply this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, good evening. I'm Jay Ionini, 26 Summit Place. Yeah. Um, I have two children in the public school system here. Both of my kids go to the high school. Olivia is a senior. Alexander is a sophomore. Okay. When we started having these conversations, my daughter was a freshman. Um, I understand that there are a lot of moving parts to this issue, but later start times is something that we absolutely need to move forward with and move forward with as soon as possible. Um, in order to do that, we need a few things from the school committee and from the administration, and I'm pleased to see that there's been more conversations around this lately. That's great. Um, we need a, a sincere commitment to move forward. We need a deadline as to which calendar year this is going to start in, and then we need a plan. Um, we have lots of parents in the district who feel the same way. Um, to Bianca's point, when we have a delay, it's a different world in my house. My kids are more well rested, um, they're happier. Let them get home a little later, let them start, let them get home a little later, let them start a little later. I think everyone's gonna be better off in the district, but you definitely have a lot of parents here who are willing to help. Um, I think we need to decide problems that we need to solve versus problems that we, we can live with. Um, and 
figure out what the plan is going to be going forward. But I think definitely setting a deadline and saying, okay, this is where we're, this is where we're going to start. This is the plan we're going to move back with and how we need to execute on that plan. So I encourage you all to think about it and please do engage us. Obviously, there are lots of us in the community who'd love to help with this issue. So thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Thanks, Jake. Sure, Jay. Hi, my name is Elizabeth Hulo. I live at 9 Mark Line Lane in uh, Newburyport. I have two children. One actually has graduated from Newburyport High School and is in college. My daughter is 11 and in sixth grade. Um, I actually am in favor of post Labor Day start. Most of my kids' school time was spent at post Labor Day. It's a great way to end the summer. If we started way earlier, that would be one thing, but we're talking about like two or three days. I think it, it's easier for my family, and we both work too, but it's easier for my family to have that kind of end to the, to the um, summer. Um, definitely, and I think most parents are in favor of half day Fridays. Um, the start school later, um, so I, I actually will say that I don't think my opinion really matters. There is an enormous body of evidence that says that kids need to start school later. This body of evidence has been looked at by the experts in the field of education, in medicine, and in psychology. They have all agreed that for our students' physical and mental health, they need to start school later. So um, respectfully, I don't think any of your opinions matter. I don't think any of our opinions matter. The experts have spoken. It's just a matter of do we want to do what's best for our kids? or do we have other priorities? Um, I want to do what's best for our kids, and my kids actually are early risers. Um, my kids probably get up 10 minutes later on the weekends, but it's what's best for our kids. Um, and I would like to just quickly say um, what time we have the younger kids start. Please do the math. What is a reasonable time for young children, six, seven, and eight, to be asleep, not in bed, but asleep at night? And what time do we have to wake them up to have them standing outside waiting for a bus in the dark by snow picks? And how safe is that? So I would say, you know, I know money's an issue, but um, when we're talking about the physical, mental health, the educational health of our kids, I think saying, well, we don't have the money, I think find the money. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Michelle Petrowski. I'm at 5 Bartlett Drive in Newburyport. I have two sons in the schools, an eighth grader and a fifth grader. Um, I'd like to speak to you guys about, I guess, overall scheduling. I am 100% in favor of Friday half days. My older son was part of the Thursday half days, and it's much easier to plan your week. It's much easier to, yay, half day. Then you have to go to school on Friday. Is, I don't think it's good for learning. Um, I am in favor of a post-Labor Day start. I think it makes scheduling easier, especially if we drafted a, a calendar that would start the Tuesday after Labor Day and front load the professional development days for those August days where the teachers would be working if we started before Labor Day anyway. Um, it would give us more five-day weeks, more concise learning, more blocks of learning, which is, I think, better for families planning and better for the kids' education. And finally, I just want to say I am 100% in support of starting school later. My son's in eighth grade, and he is at that school bus every day at 6.54. <coughs> Not 55. <laughs> you can set your watch by the bus, and it's dark. And he limps to the finish line every Friday. He is exhausted. So, um, for what it's worth, that's my opinion. I'm not going to bore you with the science that you already know. And I look forward to hearing your votes on this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm so
Um, I do really like the idea of um, a long week and then having it end on a half day Friday. I am one of those families with two working parents, so it's easier for work from home Fridays for some reason. I don't know why that is. It's just easier to get work from home time or a day off on a Friday. Um, with regard to if they're attached to holidays or not and vacations, I don't really have a strong opinion on that. I do wonder though if people are comparing to poor attendance on half day Fridays versus half day Thursdays. I'm curious if the attendance on full day Fridays is down. So can you really compare those two pieces of data? If Friday attendance is low on full days um, versus comparing them Friday half days to Thursday half days kind of seems like apples and oranges a little bit. Um, with regard to the start date, I agree with Michelle on the post Labor Day. I could swing either way. I My kids, I have one child who could have a long summer and I have one child who could go to school 50 weeks of the year, is always happy to go and happy to go back. I have one kid who wants a long summer. But I like the idea of front loading the professional development days because when we get in a string of half days and professional development days and a snow day or a snow delay and I feel like we cannot get five full days of school in consistently, that's hard for <coughs> particularly for my son who just really wants to go to school and be in school and feels better with that nice tight schedule. Um, and I also finally agree with, um, I support I should say, the later start time. I've been following it and my kids were little when it first started and I wasn't paying close attention and now I've got one kiddo headed headed to the, mall, uh, the knock. Um, and listening and starting to do my own research and talking to other people, I, I really do believe in a later school start time. And it would obviously, from my opinion, be ideal that the little kids don't have to go to school earlier. And then my, by the time it happens, my son won't be impacted, but I think for the future, I think that's a great plan. Thank you. Can you spell your last name? R I M E R. I did it. Okay, okay. thank you. I got it. <laughs> Hi, my name is Michelle Hickey. I live at 61 Story Ave, number 16. Um, and I have come up and spoken before and said that I'm in favor of a later start time. Um, is in regards, I want to speak about the school calendars that have been proposed. Um, looking at them, all school calendars are kind of a little bit disrupt disruptive. Like holidays, um, development days, um, vacations. Um, I think, you know, I'm a full-time single parent. I'm in solely in charge of my daughter's schedule. So for me, I just automatically, it, doesn't matter if we start um, later because part of my job is being in charge of my daughter's schedule and finding care for her while I'm working. That's just part of my job. What I do care about is her academics. When she's when we've been starting pre Labor Day, um, her I have not heard any actual academics happening before Labor Day. It's all about the rules. Um, you know, it's socialization. There's nothing that I see that's beneficial to her academics happening pre Labor Day. Um, so I would, I'm in favor of a post Labor Day start. The schedule's already disruptive. It's, I would like to see it kind of start and continue on instead of having three days, four days off, and then continuing into the school year. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else?
Thank you. Anybody else? <coughs> Hello, my name is Amy Warshaw. I'm at 47 Plummer Avenue, and I have a daughter in fourth grade, and I'm here to speak about the calendar, a few other things, but specifically the start date. I am in strong favor of a post-Labor Day start. Um, just to uh, reiterate some of my previous I really don't see value going to school for three days in beautiful, gorgeous August, which, which still feels like summer, which let's not forget how short and fleeting not only summer is, but childhood is. Um, it just feels like stealing those that week of summer from kids. You, so you go to school for three days. There's really not much of a curriculum. I'm not, I don't think teachers are starting units or assigning homework. At least I hope they're not before the Labor Day weekend. But then you have a four-day break you start. In terms of the kids who might be anxious, I'd argue, well, you're either anxious an entire week before Labor Day or you're anxious the Monday before Labor Day. Either way, you have to get through it. Um, so I'd also like to speak about uh, the options. And I've said before, I'm not sure why we haven't considered uh, a Tuesday start after Labor Day and front-loading the professional development days. I saw an interesting comment from a teacher on one of the threads. And as she said, as an educator, she thought front-loading the professional development days was a good idea, a sound practice, because after the summer vacation, you can focus, on, you need to kind of center yourself, get back into the grind of things, and you can focus on the work that's to be done rather than to be distracted with the kids back to school. Um, in terms of the kids, again, what other people have said, we have this choppy schedule. I argue that a more compact, concise schedule is more advantageous to kids um, rather than choppy schedule, and so two of the things, front-loading the professional development days, starting on a Tuesday, and then we can possibly get out at earlier in, in June. I had mentioned previously um, that we were getting out. Here we were going back an entire week before the rest of the kids, I mean two days, three days, but still it felt like an entire week before kids in Pentucket and Triton, yet I'm seeing all their post Facebook posts that they're getting out a day or, or a day earlier or the same day. I'm thinking, why? How, why is Newberry, why does Newberry Park have one less week of vacation? So I'm not sure why we're dragging it out, and the only option for that post-Labor Day start shows such a later end date. We can have the same exact day if we front load the professional development days and we start on Tuesday. That being said, whatever we decide, I'm absolutely in favor of a post-Labor Day start. Um, in terms of a start school later, I talked to Brian about that, he's I'm a big advocator we need to really get serious and look at that. Um, and Elizabeth so eloquently stated, does it really matter what our opinions are? The science is there, it's irrefutable, it's really what's in the best interest of our children. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Good evening, Mariana Lynch from Five Breeze Avenue. I uh, just want to express my support for post-labor day start and for half-day Fridays and also my support for uh, later start times. I'm hoping that it's about how we're gonna do it um, and not when we're gonna do it. I'm hoping that it gets done and we're here to support you guys if we can help. Um, I know there's a big group behind it. Um, you guys have seen the studies, have, have seen the science. Um, so I'm one more person to support for it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Waddell to Truman Way, Newburyport. Um, also here just to register support for starting schools later. I've been part of this conversation for years now and just kind of want to acknowledge the fact that, you know, as time ticks by, the things that are in jeopardy or on the line have to do with our children's health, academic productivity, and that's something that impacts the wellness of our community on a whole. So the science is really clear. It's really exciting to see other communities being very successful on this front. Um, there's a lot of people here willing to roll up our sleeves and get this done. So I have children that are three season athletes. I was a competitive athlete through high school. So, you know, really committed to maintaining um, athletics as part of a school
cool experience, but just really um, encouraging us to get to the point where we're trying to deal with the solutions to make this happen and kind of move out of this sort of endless deliberation phase um, while we're sort of uh, not responding to what we can see really clearly um, is playing out in the scientific world. So, and I agree with um, some of the other comments made tonight in that this should not be about us raising our hands, us packing this room. It's not about the volume of us asking this to happen. Um, it's about us acknowledging that this is what is in the best interest of students and of our community, and then trying to figure out what it's gonna take to get it done. So however I can help, would love to be part of that. Um, thank you for taking my comment. Great, thank you. Thank you. Hi, Peter McClure, 28 Federal Street. Um, I'm a parent of a sophomore in Newbury Park High School. Um, I'm also a teacher in another district. Um, and I'm here to talk uh, in support of a pre-Labor Day uh, schedule. I think uh, there's been some good points made, but as a teacher I know that whether you start before Labor Day or after Labor Day, those first weeks are all gonna be rule shedding. Um, and I look at it from a June standpoint. As a parent, my daughter has more opportunities for summer jobs by getting out earlier in June, um, summer camps, summer sport events. As uh, She's an athlete, so She's already played sports for Newbury Park High School before Labor Day, so that's not really a problem for us. But as a teacher, I know the later you go in June, the less learning goes on in the classroom. I'd rather have students up front learning than trying to take care of keeping them occupied at the end of the end of June. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. She's the only one. <laughs> I know you guys are all licking your chops out there. Okay, I can see it. All right, I'm so sorry. Um, not to be a dead horse, but they, they don't have to go later in June because we can start on Tuesday, and I'd argue it's a teacher's job to have four impactful days of learning, not start on Wednesday, not start on Thursday, but start Tuesday, front load the professional development days, and we can get, we can get out on the same day as a pre-Labor Day start. Thank you. So, thank, thank you. I know I'm a softie. <laughs> <laughs> well, Hearing nobody love, else, love you, nobody else is, is fighting for the microphone. Um, do we have any warrants? Yes, we have some warrants, three warrants. I move that the following name bills of the Newburyport Public Schools amounting in the aggregate $8,473.91 approved and forwarded to the city auditor for payment. There are no conflicts. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 One absent. The next warrant, I move that the following name bills and payrolls of the Newburyport Public Schools amounting in the aggregate $15,989.60 be approved and forwarded to the city auditor to make payment and deduct the funds from the school's account. Second. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. And the last warrant, <clears throat> I move that the following name bills of the Newburyport Public Schools amounting in the aggregate $198,997.85 be approved and forwarded to the city auditor for payment. There are no conflicts. Second. Discussion. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Who seconded that? Nick. Okay, thank you, Nick. Terrific. Uh, we have a set of minutes from our meeting of January 22nd, 2019. Do I have somebody move them? I move approval of the minutes. Is that? Yeah, I think January 7th. No, it's January 7th. Yes, it's, it's a late one. Yes, okay, I'm sorry. Yes, January 7th. Excuse me. Do we have a second? Second. Okay. Um, I'm sorry. I'm treating the public comment. From, do the, are the names 
Should we edit them if the name's wrong? Ah, uh, yes, if you have. Um, the public comment, you have Anne Louise Grant, it's Anne Elise. Anne Louise. I'll write it down for you. Um, we are at the point of Thank adopting you. the minutes with the minor change. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Abstain. Wait, who? I wasn't here. Abstain. Okay. And one abstention. I'm going to turn it over now to uh, recognition of staff and students, which means the superintendent is awesome. up and on. All right. Well, um, as part of our uh, meetings, we really want to recognize our students and staff each meeting. And tonight we have a bunch of students out there. And I'll call up Mr. Wolf, our high school principal. But I also want to recognize, um, and we'll get into more details when Mr. Wolf comes on up. But uh, Sarah Ledbeater and the North Shore Aero team. Um, for placing in uh, competition. And basically their challenge was uh, they designed a drone uh, capable of aerial surveillance of green space within the city to detect plant stress, which is a pretty great um, project. Um, but I want to call Mr. Wolf up and uh, Sarah Ledbeater to kind of really articulate what the student's project does and <laughs> really just let the community know uh, this project-based <coughs> team. And uh, from my short time in Newburyport for the past five months, uh, Ms. Ledbeater uh, does an amazing, amazing job at the high school and really um, connects her classroom to the real world and our students are developing these types of projects. And for them to be recognized at such a high level, she deserves uh, Tremendous amount of credit. So, congratulations there. I think we'll have all the kids come up. I heard Zach, you're going to be the one who goes into greater detail on the project. <laughs> I heard everybody uh, passing that up. I believe it was a. Uh, <laughs> uh, <yeah. laughs> But really to kind of uh, reiterate uh, what Sean was just talking about in regards to Sarah, uh, just the creativity of the courses that she's designed has really given our kids exposure to some of a lot of the uh, kind of the new world that, well, I guess I'm already, I already have my career, but that they'll be uh, entering into. Um, and the real world design challenge uh, that I was able to, you know, you know, sometimes I'm in the office pretty late. I'd be walking upstairs and there's all this energy coming out of room, was it 340? Um, and it is just absolutely amazing the work um, that the students uh, put into this project. It was, the document was thick. It was like a business plan. Um, and where they had to come up with a design for a drone to survey healthy vegetation within city limits. But then really, the coolest part was just all of the problems that they brainstormed with their design and then coming up with solutions for this. Um, it was very Elon Muskish, I have to say. Uh, so Zach, why don't you come on up and uh, give a little bit more insight and then you guys can introduce yourselves. Thank you, well, I'm Zach. I'm gonna speak more to the business aspect of the uh, project because that's more what I was responsible for. Um, so the business part of the project, which was a big portion of the project was to design a business plan with a budget. Um, you have to outline operating costs, your cost benefit analysis, profit analysis, um, also your support personnel costs. It's kind of like a big comprehensive um, part of the project. And it's also a challenge because usually the people who do this project usually are in it more for like the engineering part. But I was more in it because uh, not that I say that I don't like love the engineering part because obviously I find that very interesting. Also, I wouldn't really dedicate so much time doing it, but I'm more in it for like the business aspect because I went to business school and the like. So the business part was really a big aspect of it. And historically, that's where we've lost points in the past. And this year, uh, I think we sort of remedied that a little bit more uh, to gain some more points back in that area. And the business part, it's very comprehensive. I think it was probably more than like 15 pages, something like that. And uh, it's all different analyses, a lot of budgeting, 
a lot of write-ups. You have to figure out how is this company going to make money. You have to budget in a 15% profit. And it, it works like that. And it plays into the design part as well because you need to make sure the business plan corresponds with what the design team had in mind to make sure that their ideas are feasible. So there was a lot of saying no to some different ideas, but <laughs> other than that, I'm gonna have Thomas speak to more of the design parts. Um, so we had a lot of different challenges. So in past years, we've done a lot of agricultural challenges where we survey uh, plant health in fields or we look at uh, different surveying in rural area, uh, areas. But uh, this year we were challenged with going into an urban environment, which made it a lot, a lot more complicated because we had to factor in that buildings are close together. And if you crash into a field, it's not a big deal, but we needed to worry about colliding into people on sidewalks if there's any problem with navigation or anything like that. We needed to worry about birds. We needed to worry about uh, sonar bouncing off uh, windows wrong. We needed to worry about infrared not being picked up in the sunlight and a lot of different things. Uh, actually, one of the interesting bits that we got to do, um, we had to worry about emergency landing, as I said earlier. And if we lost propellers, our basic, if we lost navigation, we would just fly back to a designated point by flying straight up to gain GPS, because in a city, you can't get GPS down by the buildings. Um, but if we lost propulsion, we wouldn't be able to fly up anymore. If we lost an engine, we'd start to go down. So we actually, uh, we by FAA regulations, we had to have a chase vehicle. So we had a van that followed the drone around, and we designed a rack to put on the top of the drone that had a QR code, so it could be scanned by a camera in a second without any worry about it finding the right spot or landing somewhere that it wasn't supposed to. And it could track that QR code, notify the people in the van to stop, and it could land actually on top of the van in the middle of the city. And it was just interesting to come up with a bunch of different real life applications of different engineering ideas that we might get to learn about in school, but we often don't get to actually get to do the fun stuff with, actually get to design it. So it was really fun. Um, it was really challenging to find out how to navigate in a city. Uh, actually, a huge part of that design was actually Camden. And actually, he should probably be the one to talk about it. So Camden, welcome up. Sure. Um, my name is Camden Johnson. And I was the chief engineer of the project. So I did the kind of designing of the base drone. So we chose a hexacopter platform, which is, it's a little circle with sticks coming off of it that held six motors. Um, so Thomas was talking about how we had to prepare for various different situations. One of the largest ones that came into designing of the physical drone was if a motor were to fail. Um, so I chose, or we chose a hexacopter platform, which has six motors. So it's a pretty smart platform because if one motor were to fail, the motors can change the direction of their thrust so that it can stably or fairly stably still land on the um, the Ford Transit van that we chose. So it was really it was a really fun challenge for me since I never I had a little bit of back, background in um, like drone design since I find that stuff interesting, but I never really gotten to design something such large scale as this. Um, so it was a really interesting and fun challenge, and I'm really glad I got to do it with these guys. Awesome. Got background in drone design. <laughs> got this background in drone design. Uh, I'm Max Scientist, and I was kind of like the team mathematician on this. And so a really cool part about this project is that it's a research and design paper. So once you research and design a drone, part of it is proving that your drone can actually fly. That's cool because we have a lot of faculty at the school that can really help us with the math and physics behind it, and all the flight dynamics and figure out the drag and how fast it will go how long the electronics will last and therefore how far you can go before you have to go back and recharge it. And so I think it's just a great project where you can actually apply what you learn in school to like real life. And so I think it's a great way for students to like just experience that. And here's the ladies who designed the camera. Um, <coughs> sorry. Uh, I'm Carolyn Laughlin, and I helped uh, find a camera used for the, the drone to survey plant stress. We actually ended up using two cameras on our drone. One was for navigation, which, which Camden uh, found, and then I had a multi-spectral camera that I found uh, used to detect plant stress. 
Uh, we also researched what exactly plant, plant stress is, and Sophie and I um, also designed the, the survey path um, that the drone will take to effectively and to, to effectively survey all of the, the plants and also in a time effective manner. Tourism. Wow. Can I ask a question? Very impressive yeah. stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Can I ask you? And I guess this is a question for everybody, but I'm listening to you guys talk as high school students, and I'm wondering if there's any way we could get you to go to the middle school and remind kids or show kids for the first time that um, academics has some cachet in the world and that it's not about you know the the bling we see all over TV, but but it's cool to be smart and do smart things. Because um, I don't know if, as an inspirational piece, I don't know if kids coming up through the system kind of understand where you know that question where are we ever going to use this kind of thing. So if you're if you're finding practical applications for the math and the science reasons to stay in it, and I guess some long term hope for some kids who maybe don't play sports or don't get involved in clubs that we've all heard about and read in the newspaper. I think it would be a pretty awesome use of time to you know, land a drone on a van in the knock parking lot, <laughs> for example. We unfortunately um, didn't actually get to build it. It was a theoretical design. What they didn't tell you is that they wrote a 54-page paper, uh, technical paper, defending their research and basically outlining the math and science that proves that this thing would work. They have an entire part of this. We could buy all the pieces. I just don't think we could afford them. <laughs> and, and actually, to your point about going down to the middle school, I've had the opportunity to go down with Mrs. Ledbeater as part of the STEM Expo a couple of years in a row. That's been a good opportunity. But I went to the IC when I uh, came through school. And uh, there, we had a little bit of a program that my dad helped start up that we just did actually what Mrs. Ledbeater does, just very basically with some Lego robotics. And that's just an awesome way to get people started and to get people involved and get people to start working on it. And it's really awesome to, it was awesome to work on that because we got to do it every day for like a couple of weeks and it was awesome to do that. So I feel that something more long term or something that is a more sustained program would be a lot better for learning that way. I like the way you think. Great. Terrific. Usually we take what, a... What do you, do you estimate it would cost to build that? Oh, they will tell you exactly. Uh, it was under, yeah, it was under, just under $100,000. That includes your van. That includes, <laughs> <laughs> that includes the special That includes the van. Did you uh, trick out the van? Is really the yes. question. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. Camera so we expensive. also factored in man hours and yeah, you have to do a lot of electronic labor. hours and how long it would take for it to survey a certain city that we have a plan for. So we 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 did a lot of numbers. We have a total cost, which is a little bit under a uh, hundred thousand. But if you talk about the drone itself, it's about eight thousand. And we were just Sean, you can find we were, <laughs> that's right. You know, interesting enough, we were just at a meeting talking about whether or not we should be funding student it's projects. Project, yeah. Just, just had that conversation a yeah, couple hours before ago. you came in. Well, and I think that that's part of um, kind of our philosophy working with uh, Mr. The Wolf and and the other. It's really taking what we're learning in the classroom and applying it to the real world and giving real world experiences and. I'll tell you, this, this type of project, it, it ties everything together on um, really, as we start looking at project base and you know the NEF and making these community partnerships, um, really all of us in it together to create these, uh, not only the lessons in the, in the classroom, but really tying them into the community. And then I think that becomes part of our culture. So, you know, we're recognizing students uh, for all aspects of uh, this this student life, but uh, just amazing. I mean, I've amazing. you know, as I, my previous experience, um, you know, I was a high school principal for a very long time, and you know, robotics programs, uh, performing arts, 
um, all of those programs, um, you know, it's just when you can make those real world connections that these students are going to have as they move forward, it's you can't replace that. And the confidence and the presentation, collaboration, the teamwork that you all have had to come together to, to make this project happen. Where very proud of you um, for your efforts, but we're really proud as a school system for your success um, in representing this community. So we're really excited. And when I, when I saw your achievement, uh, this is exactly uh, what we want to recognize students and teachers for. And you know, we're really, really excited. I might, you know, publicly, we should probably stop this presentation because I might take them to Shark Tank and uh, <laughs> maybe I can jump in and be the manager and then, you know, we can create these drones. So. You, you donate any award money to the rest. I'll district. buy you a cup of coffee. Okay. <laughs> Next, why don't we take a, well, like a yeah. two minute break here and get everybody up here so say we can get some pictures. Parents. Yeah, say hi to great, parents. great. So, uh, Mr. Wolf and let me, why don't you come on up and the students will take a couple of photos. And the school committee members and some parents out there if you want to. Steve's our unofficial uh, photographer here. <laughs> We're going to go right over where uh, Mr. Men is. Let's just see we go. He's going to add this to the school committee. Angie, you want to jump in? All right. So jump in and see if we can get everybody in here. So this certificate is yours.
Mr. Hawkeyes, I'm sure is on route. Um, so we should talk about. Home. We're back in session. Um, we're going to get a week. Um, is Andy going to present the um, overnight field trip? Yes. Okay, terrific. Why don't you? That would be great. Yeah. All right, so now I'm putting on my other hat and talking about Silbot, which is the robotic sailing team um, that is also a class. It's a Monday night class. Um, for the last six years, um, we've competed in this competition. It's actually a competition for college students um, that we were invited to participate in a number of years ago when Olin College hosted it in Gloucester. And we've pretty much been going every year since. Um, this year's trip, uh, whoever wins has to host it. So WPI won for a second time <coughs> last year, so they're hosting it again. Um, so last year, basically, we went to WPI for a week. Um, and we have two, I don't know if anyone, some of you have been up to the robotics lab at the high school to see them. We have two large six-foot sailboats um, that the kids have actually built. They've outfitted them with electronics, and they program them to sail themselves, sometimes successfully, sometimes they sink. Um, last year, uh, last year was amazing. They got it, because you give it to GPS coordinates, and then the boat sails and tacks to the GPS coordinate, and it rounds it, and it does it, and it was doing it. Unfortunately, it, um, we went backwards around the course. Um, so we didn't actually get any points for it, but it didn't. Um, so we're hoping to improve this year. <laughs> That's great. Um, and basically what I would like to do is I would like permission to take the team to Worcester again. Um, we'd like to structure it the same as we did last year. Basically, we rented a house. Um, the seniors who are done by the time the trip happens, it is the second week in June right after graduation, um, will mostly come for the full week. Um, because what happens is we need to be there because A, there's a lot of travel, uh, but B, we spend a lot of time in the evenings fixing problems with our boats. Uh, there's usually a lot of mechanical failures, a lot of electronic parts that accidentally get doused with water and need to be uh, replaced. Um, so a lot of work that goes on sort of in the evening hours. So last year we rented a house, we worked in the evenings, we went in each day, and then we had another van that came from the high school each day with some of the underclassmen who just stayed for like a night or two and then returned. So because it was last year it interfered with exams, it's earlier this year. Um, that was how they didn't feel too bad leaving and could um, but still participate. Any questions? I mean, I think the usual question that we ask is, um, uh, is, um, is there a way to pick up the cost for students who might have difficulty with that? Um, so, well, I don't know if you'd like to pick up the cost for students who have difficulty with that. I don't know. Great. Um, I'm asking what the plan is. Yes. Um, all right. So the actual boats are funded by the NEF. Uh, we mm -hmm. have a business partnership grant. They've actually given us two rounds of funding. We have $4,000 this year to build them. That's separate than the actual trip funding. Um, the dessert auction that we ran the Tuesday before Thanksgiving, um, half of that money goes to the juniors and the other half uh, is for Selbot, which we use to offset the cost of the trip. Because it's in Worcester, it's a lot less expensive than it has in other years when we've had to fly. Um, the way we structured it last year is we said, uh, we, we include all the meals, um, because one of the things that happens is that they won't stop working to eat. Um, so you have to physically put food between them and the boat if you want them to eat things. Um, is that fair? Yes. yes. Um, so we provide meals. So what we did is people who came for a day trip, um, it cost uh, $20 for the day. And if they stayed overnight, it was $100 for an overnight. Um, Mike last year had a little bit of money that he kicked in for anyone who was uh, afford it. But we managed to get it down as far as possible just by having done some fundraising. Um, and the money we have built up from year to year. Questions? No questions. Um, would anybody like to make a motion to approve this? So the approval of the sailboat team to Worcester uh, in June. Second. Any discussion? Thank you. All those. Thank you very much. <laughs> All those in favor? Aye. 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 Terrific. You got it. Let's tackle start time. Let's go for it. This is their class time. They might come from class to be here. <laughs> oh, they got it. Yeah. Because that flex. Um, we don't go. have a Newburyport High School student rep, although we've had a number of students representing. We should hit up the one who goes to the NEF. Yeah. They have two. Yeah. So. <laughs> um, so uh, we have a conversation now about the budget form format. Um, 
we have a budget forum coming up. It is a forum for the community. We've done it a number of different ways over a number of different years, and I would actually um, encourage some of the school committee members who have been through several of these to help us figure out what the best process is for doing it. Um, the goals of the um, budget forum are to present to the community uh, what some of the priorities coming out of the district are for, uh, for the budget. Um, whether there's an overall focus in any given year, um, but also to pragmatically discuss some of the money that's available to us and, and what, that, what the impact of that is. So I would throw it open to, you know, to a format that, that works for the community and works for the district. I, I think that, of the, thinking back on the various forms that we've had, <coughs> The ones that seem to have been most successful in having the greatest amount of participation were when we were able to call out, present, and open for discussion specific uh, issues or initiatives that we were trying to address within our budget. Uh, so it wasn't just throwing up the, bulk of the budget and trying to explain line item by line item where we were going, but rather saying, hey, you know, we're going to have to close the school, going back to that one, mm -hmm. unless we can come up with a creative solution. And there was a lot of discussion around that. Uh, or, uh, you know, whatever, whatever the issues are that we're facing here, you know, whether it be earlier start times and the, the budgetary implications of that, or, uh, uh, whatever other issues are, are hot topics this year as, as the superintendent and the principals begin to assemble their wish lists and their uh, their desires and how to make them work uh, I, I would uh, suggest that we try to put them into discussion pods if you will uh, discussion buckets that will uh, encourage people to come and, and give us their, their opinion. The second piece I would add to that is that after the, um, after we have the forum, I think we need to publish some kind of a response to the forum that basically says, hey, we heard you, this is what you came up with, this is what we discussed, and by the way, in the budget, it's going to be reflected in this way, or it's not going to be reflected in the budget because of other priorities, or whatever, whatever the outcome may be. But I think people are willing to give uh, input if they know that they're going to get feedback. If they think that they're coming to give input, and it's just going to be some voices talking in the wilderness, and we're staring back at them like a deer in the headlights, uh, we're not going to get that, that level of, of participation. Great. Anybody else have some thoughts? Go ahead. Yes, jump in. Yes, so the, and that's for me as, as I'm coming in, you know, we've already started our budget process. Um, we added, um, you know, throughout the district. So added more elements to the process itself. But when I was looking at the budget forum format, I kind of wanted to get that on the agenda to kind of get the history of how that, that looked, which will give me an opportunity to craft a presentation. I would hesitate um, in the sense of the school councils, um, for each building made up of teachers, parents, um, you know, this was one of the priorities for this year is making sure that they're actively involved, um, you know, working with the principals in the budget process. So we, we focused on, on that with the parents um, at those um, school councils. So I think you're also getting information from parents and, and um, you know, throughout one of the presentations and public comment, there was a mention of that. Um, I think it was the high school parent that uh, has been part of um, the process, the budget process, uh, tied to the uh, improvement plan. So I think that that's, that's also a very important aspect of when they're developing budgets to have the 
those school councils be mm -hmm. part of that process mm -hmm. and to outline at each school um, some of the priorities and then district-wide we collect that data and then continue to work with parents on that process mm -hmm. um, so I just for, for me coming into the district mm -hmm. I just get some feedback on what that form has looked like in the past we've done um, we've done Sean, we've done a, a presentation of the, the budget sort of you know, general, in general a general mm -hmm. overview um, <clears throat> we've also had times where uh, the uh, school councils and, and the president uh, and the principals will come in and talk a little bit about what their priorities are and I think um, I personally have always found that very helpful and very persuasive when I see the principal and a school council member um, coming in and saying well this year this is what we wanted to focus on um, <clears throat> and you know, and then we have to, I think, very frankly, take a look at what our capacity is. Um, you know, the mayor has given us a figure um, that we're trying to work with, um, but we also have some things we want to do. Um, so it, it's, a, it's a chance to share some of that with the community in addition to getting feedback from the community about what they would like to see us thinking about. So, so um, it, it, in, a, in a way, it's an opportunity for the school council principal to talk about their conversations and their priorities. But it, it, the other side of it is that we do get feedback from the community, mm -hmm. um, uh, interesting feedback often, about what, what we might look at, what they think priorities should be. Um, so we're, we don't expect a finished budget to Correct. be presented it's to us, an overview. but it priorities. helps to know the direction that the district wants to go mm -hmm. in. Uh, Sean, perhaps it would be helpful also for, uh, you know, we've been doing the same kinds of things with mixed success year over year. Sometimes very successfully, sometimes you sort of say, okay, well, I guess we checked that one off our list, but did we really get much out of it? Did we move, did we move the needle? Uh, so I think it would help be helpful to us to hear what some of your ideas are, what has worked for you in, in prior uh, It sounds, it sounds similar, right? It sounds similar um, with the overview um, and really looking at that, you know, if it's a, the 3.5% increase um, and kind of, I think, showing the, the challenges of the district um, and kind of what our focus, district-wide, what the focus is on. But I also like the idea of um, having the principals with the so site council, council. Pat, yes, yeah. kind of uh, articulate, I think, to the community at large and also to the school committee, um, kind of this, you know, tying their budget needs to their school improvement plan and all the work that they've done. So yeah. I think that's also an important piece. Um, and then for us, um, because working within the city, you know, it's a little bit different where the timelines you know, because it revolves a little bit more than working in the town at the, you know, the town, mm -hmm. the town votes and the town, you know. Uh, so I think for us, I think this budget forum, that's kind of how I see it, kind of where we are as a district, having our principals along with the uh, school council members uh, presenting, um, looking uh, at some of the general priorities that, that we have and then kind of then listening, regrouping um, as a leadership team, and then really start narrowing that down, uh, and then coming back to the school committee with more of a specific kind of outline, wh what we want to accomplish and what we have. Because as you know, with um, funding from the state, you know, it, it comes in later for the cities. Um, so those, those could adjust, but at least everybody would be on the same page with kind of what the priorities are and kind of what our means are to operate in. So I think that's, that's one of the things that we've right. been able to do successfully is saying, okay, this is where we are right now. Correct. But should the gods on, on Beacon Hill smile upon us, right. here's the next thing we want to do. And if they smile a little more, sure. here's the next right. thing we want to do. Yeah, that's great. We've gotten away from it, but in other years, I'm trying to remember if it's, I think, prior 
significantly prior to the budget process. We, we used to have an annual meeting with our state legislative yep. representatives yep. that they would come in and we would talk about what, what we were looking at and what we were hoping to see. Um, and they would respond to that based on sort of their knowledge of what was going on in the state. We've gotten away from that yeah. over the last I think year. Time we, yeah. I don't think we've, we've done it since Badur and Krostov had yeah. their show. Yep. Yeah. Wow. Thanks. Well, That's a long time ago. <laughs> That's a long time we used to have opportunities to send in letters of what we thought were important to. I know I've sent in a few to yeah. former Senator Ives. Uh, so, about what their legislative priorities should be. And we can, you know, name a host of things, not just school, not just like. Well, it, it just might be, might, might be okay. good to revive that. Um, for the guys who are more recent additions to the school committee, what hasn't been there in the past that you would like to see happening? Yeah, I just, I wonder since, you know, we have a new superintendent and it's a new way we're, we're budgeting, if, if somehow that can just be part of the process. So, so the community knows, you know, hey, we're, we're looking at everything, we're really trying to rethink what we've been doing, and, and it's just it's a way that we're checking on what we've been doing. Are we just right. throwing money at the same stuff every year, or right. can, you know, can we reimagine what we're trying to do? Maybe mm -hmm. we can allocate those funds to different strategic priorities we're trying to do, and then relate that back to the strategic plan. I mean, th those are the th things I'd like to hear. But, right, yeah. exactly. I, I guess a few things on my mind are, number one is transparency. So. I really dislike asking the community members what they want us to prioritize in our budget if we're going to come to them and tell them that we're not, we're prioritizing like <coughs> treading, treading water in our budget. So I think we need to be honest with them. And like Nick said, then at that point we could say if somehow we came into a bunch of money, you know, what would you like to see? What would our school councils like to see? Mm -hmm. um, but I don't think we need to go through everything that we spend on a line item so much as what are we looking at? Um, yeah. Something that always comes up, Sean, just so you know, at budget time is class sizes. Mm -hmm. Always comes up. Um, and I will just say, I think as a district, we've never done a good job in the three years I've been on the committee and five years I've been to come in, coming to the committee meetings, we've never done a good job at accurately telling the story of what our class sizes look like. Um, you're squinting at me, but we always, <laughs> always have a disagreement about what our class sizes are and what they would be every year. So that, that so would be we, fine. We end up having multiple meetings and multiple information centers about what our class sizes are. Um, so I, I think if we could get that right, that would help a lot. Um, Maybe that would be enough. I mean, the, the class size discussion becomes important because that's a that's a <clears throat> that's one spot where you can leverage additional funding. You can rethink how we're doing classes. <clears throat> Traditionally, this district has been really resistant to increasing class sizes. You know, we set some guidelines. I don't know how many years ago, and we've tried to stick with them, and, and for the most part, have. We've bumped above them a couple of times. But I don't think we've made any significant changes, and I can't remember when. No, I can't remember. It certainly is not part of our official policy, but it was probably decided at a meeting way back when, and we stuck to it pretty much. Yeah. So I, I think you're right. I think something else that always comes up that we don't do a good job explaining is charter school funding. Anytime we have a public forum, somebody wants to know what the charter school budget looks like and how that gets paid, and and I think there's always a lot of confusion about what that actually looks like. Um, it's probably a one-page infographic that we can put on the screen. And for, for some reason, so, people always claim that we pay a million dollars off the top just to have it in the district. I, I don't know why that keeps coming up, but it does. It might. That actually might be really helpful. Mm -hmm. So if we could just maybe, get I know Ethan, I think, has has it all kind of boiled down because it's actually part of the city budget, not the school budget. But if we could lay that out for people in the chapter 70 debacle. Of from the, from the, uh, yeah, the chapter 70 funding. 
if I may, the yeah. idea of, uh, especially with Governor Baker's bill, Chapter 70, the restructuring, yeah. I think this might be a great time to bring in our local politicians who are working through this new bill and w what impact is that going to have on Newburyport? Because we've been, I've been to a lot of informational the, sessions on that, but I think if we can schedule um, some of our um, you know, state officials to come in and really communicate that to the uh, Newburyport community, I think that would be great because then you, as a school committee, can ask uh, direct questions on you know on that funding formula and how it's really uh, going to have an impact on schools and then the suburban schools uh, where it may not have a big impact at all. So and if they can't, that would be great. If they can't come, I. I would imagine that the state school committee association has some people who have been looking at mm -hmm. Chapter 70 funding for quite some time and yeah. may be willing to help us. Sure. I, I think when you're looking at that, the, the good news is, and I'm going to touch base on in my presentation, uh, since the Every Form Act of 93, they haven't looked at uh, restructuring, look at that funding since then. So the first time they've actually looked at it, they began that conversation in 2015, and they have restructured the formula. Um, so I think that's the good news. Uh, the bad news is I still think it's going to be uh, inequities among some of the suburban um, school systems. And so I think that that's the second piece of the formula, that's, along with special education. That they, that's what we still need to get an answer. We need to hear that the answer sure. from you is what does this all mean to move report? Correct. So I think that's <coughs> that if we can uh, get them to come. If we can get them to come to the forum, that would be perfect. That would be great. If not, the, the, let's the get them together after. to have. Correct. They can either be here at a meeting or we can. In the past, we've scheduled a meeting more to accommodate them, so it usually I occurs see. at like three in the afternoon when they're not at the state house. Sure. Or, so. or we've had them part of the joint ed meeting. Have we? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah, we'll, we'll come up with some dates. That way the city council gets to hear from them. Sean, do you have enough uh, that we, you and I yes, can sit this down is and great. try and yeah. relate something? Absolutely. Great. Um, any additional thoughts on it? Just get them directly to Sean. Um, the next item on the agenda, I'm going to turn over to Sean. All right. It looks like uh, a discussion and possible vote on calendar. Absolutely. Is that on the agenda tonight? Yes. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> have you noticed? <laughs> yes. Um, so you have all you have the a lot of the calendars that went out. I kind of uh, want to do a little presentation on some of the background. Um, just regarding the, the accountability, because as we've been talking about, attendance data is now really going to have some some impact on um, accountability with the new uh, next generation MCAS and 2.0. I, I love this. This reminds me of say, this little cartoon. Is a list of 100,000 warehouses full of data. I'd like you to condense them down into one meaningful warehouse. So I think that, especially when we start looking at attendance, um, that's kind of where the state is right now, um, trying to figure this out. But just for accountability, and, and I'm just going to go through this quick, there's a, just a, a few slides here. But this all started in, uh, if we remember, uh, Nation at Risk is a 1983 report on public education in the United States which really led to the standards movement, content and standards. This is when um, this really started being pushed across the United States. So from 93 to, uh, from 83 to 1993, Massachusetts um, took a look at all of these standards, and that's when we came up with the Education Reform Act of uh, Ed Reform of 1993. So this is when the standardized testing, this is um, for the public with school committee, um, which ties you know, your responsibility with school committees in the sense of uh, you know, policy, budget, hiring and firing a superintendent. It really kind of took the, a lot of um, what school committees in the past were doing really to narrow down that um, effect. 
So then we had the Massachusetts curriculum frameworks um, that really focused that all students should be able to achieve at high levels, uh, regardless of disabilities or economically disadvantaged. So our first class um, with all of this, the first MCAS came up in 2003. That was the first class that had to pass um, to get a diploma. And there was a lot of work that went in there because I was a teacher at the time in the late 90s. So if you look at all of the uh, ed reform and all of these different uh, initiatives uh, from the federal government to the state level. So in 2002, this is the No Child Left Behind Act that was passed, um, which 100% of all the students will be proficient in both ELA and math by the year of 2015. So that was across the, the whole nation. And then we reflected on what was known as AYP, Annual Yearly Progress, and that's when they were gonna tie funds, uh, federal funds to students out, uh, for school districts that were performing. The high level, you got more money. At a, if you weren't performing at a, a high level, you didn't get as much money. So then they figured out that in around 2007, this goal of every student in the United States is going to be proficient. Um, by 2015, they said, you know what? We probably should kind of refigure this a little bit. So in Massachusetts, we were in the beginning looking at AYP, annual yearly progress. And then that shifted over to a CPI, Composite Performance Index. So basically what Massachusetts did was they took a lot of different uh, indicators and they came up with this formula, CPI. So what started to happen, uh, 2007 to 10, CPI index, a lot of your high performing districts were scoring pretty high in their CPI, math and ELA. Some of your uh, lower performing districts in the Commonwealth um, their CPI was at a much, much lower level. So uh, the state and the DSC uh, figured, you know, this is uh, not a good way of measuring um, across the Commonwealth. So they came up with this idea, let's take a look at uh, student growth percentiles. So they took all base, 2000 baseline data, data points in LA math for all schools. They created a six yard target of where you should be for growth. Um, and they put all schools on that baseline data for a six yard target. So what if you recall, when SGP came out in 2011, that's when you started getting the rankings. You know, level one, level two, level three, level four, and level five. So basically, in the first two years, your high performing districts were all becoming level ones right away. Um, what started to happen there is when some of the high performing districts achieved high CPI index within that target, the second year they were level one, the second year they became a level two. So a lot of your highest performing districts were level two. Um, what this ended up benefiting um, was some of the low performing districts, because if you had a, a bigger target to grow, every year you could meet those targets. So with a student growth percentile, some of those schools were meeting targets being a level one school, but when you're looking at proficiency for all the students, they weren't meeting proficiency on the standards. So with all that uh, coming down and looking at 2015, No Child Left uh, Behind, the new act that we're all looking at right now is Every Student Succeeds Act. So that's a focus on college and career readiness. 21st century learning. At the same time with PARC and all of these different uh, standardized tests to test the common core throughout the nation, um, Massachusetts, who has the number one uh, school system in the United States, took that same idea of a PARC and now they've created this next generation MCAS new assessment. So MCAS 2.0. So here's some of the, with this new law for the ESSA, just a brief overview. It holds all students to high academic standards. It is a focus on success in college and work. Provides more kids to uh, access high quality preschool. Guarantees steps to help students and schools improve. Reduces the burden of testing while maintaining annual information for parents and students. And promotes local innovation and invest. That's the idea of uh, the ESSA. So when you look at what's this next generation MCAS, and I'm sure uh, Angel and everyone, you probably have this, 
Um, but basically, it's just an updated version. Now, this was a 20-year-old test, and uh, DESE um, really want to take those par concepts, the critical thinking abilities, application of uh, knowledge, and making connections between reading and writing, um, to really focus on higher order uh, level uh, tests. A clearer signal of readiness for the next grade or college and careers. And then this, as you all know, is designed to be computer-based testing. So um, all tests from grades three to grade 10 on the uh, MCAS 2.0 will be computer-based. Um, though paper versions will be available for students with disabilities and or 504s or whatever those special combinations are. But for Newburyport, uh, grades three to 10, um, we'll all be tested in language, uh, arts and math, and sciences for grades five, eight, and 10, and this is all computer-based, um, which will happen this spring. So for the next, then that's what I just had, I just had that outline, 2019 grades uh, three through eight and grades 10 um, will all be computer-based, paper test combinations with disabilities or new uh, English learners. So parents have seen this new um, results coming in. Um, so when you're looking at this, so this has changed. So right now, uh, not meeting expectations, uh, <coughs> partially meeting expectations, um, meeting expectations and exceeding. So on the bottom left, you can see the school district data. And one of the changes that's gonna happen um, next year is they're gonna call a new category, which is that, I wanna say that in the 480s to 90s, or the 490s that you're closer to meeting expectations, they're gonna have a new category called approaching expectations will become that new category. So that's kind of like a overview of how the testing has changed and accountability has changed. So, DESE, our state's looking at uh, beyond the test scores. So this is, you've heard this, social emotional learning um, throughout, uh, through the state, through our district, throughout the Commonwealth. So scores can identify areas where students need academic support, but scores can also reflect on what these, they call these non-academic barriers to learning. One of those non-academic areas is student attendance. Okay, so the DESC and the districts continue to work together to teach with poverty in mind, build cultural competency, address this portion, disproportionate excessive student absence, support homeless students, make schools safe for vulnerable students, social emotional learning. So that's kind of like the overview and kind of the focus. Um, really, really important because we, we really understand we need to address these issues. So for us, we do not just focus tonight just on this non-academic barrier to learn. So chronic absenteeism is now a new um, subgroup. So similar to the other subgroups, special education, economically disadvantaged, if there's um, uh, diversity within the school population. So now we have this new subgroup, all schools in the Commonwealth, called chronic absenteeism. And chronic absenteeism is a percentage of students missing 10% or more of their days uh, in membership schools, and that's us, 18 days and 180 days school year. So that's the, eight, anything 18 days or over is this new subgroup. So we, as we were talking about Fridays, and, and I'm coming in and, and gathering information <coughs> from the community, um, we started to just to take a look at this. So from our attendance last year, okay, um, we have district-wide, and remember, kindergarten and uh, uh, pre-kindergarten and kindergarten are not part of this. It's grades one uh, through 12 that are looking at attendance. Um, but I just, I pulled this out and looked at total attendance. So we had 144 students. Um, this is with 18 absences or more throughout the year. Um, so you can see, uh, last year, based on last year's attendance data, um, you know, there's, we have definitely subgroups throughout the, throughout Newberry Poor Public Schools. And this is why I think it's really important, this presentation, you know, for the thousands of people that are watching tonight, or maybe the four people, 
Um, but really important, I think, for principals, for our site, uh, school councils, to really understand that attendance is, is becoming part of this accountability. Um, so five years ago, if my son or daughter uh, was doing well academically, and I extended a vacation or, I, or um, uh, going on a vacation, and they maintain their academics. Um, and I said, well, you know, they're, they're meeting the standards, they're doing well. Um, I have a right to, you know, keep my child out for, for whatever reason. I think it's just parents need to understand that now we're being um, measured in attendance. Um, you know, for all this, so here are the individual students. You can see the high population, but also they're monitoring the attendance data um, throughout the district. Um, and a 98, I would say a 97, 98 is, 98 to 100 is great. Uh, 97 is okay, but when you start slipping down attendance-wise for the year at a 96, a 95, anything below a 95 is like a major red flag too. So we're looking at that attendance. So there's also another uh, group, it's called Lowest Performing Students. Uh, and here's really the, the category and definition. So this is not just high needs, this is not uh, um, uh, economically disadvantaged students or special education students. This is uh, students in any population within the Commonwealth, with any school, um, that's your lowest performing. So for example, if you have um, say we had the, the, the best school in the world and every student's proficient, okay? They're going to take a percentage of those students, even though they're proficient, you're still going to have a lowest performing group within every school. So that's, that's a, a new category uh, that they monitor or that the state's going to be looking at. So the other piece that they're trying to monitor here is the uh, transient populations, where in some districts, uh, students move in for a year, and then they're moving out. So they move in, and then they're moving out. Not so much here in Newburyport, but in other districts, you have a population of coming in and coming out, coming in and coming out. So with that being said, um, that second bullet is they want those students who have been enrolled in the same school for two consecutive years is also going to get tied in to some of this data. So it's not just you're here for a year and then you left. You have to be in here for two years. So that's, that's kind of a good, good piece. So what does this mean right now? And just for us, just so that everyone understands, right now they're monitoring chronic absenteeism. Remember, the uh, state is now for grade 10, it's going to be computer based. So they're going to have a lot of this information um, a lot easier accessible. So they're going to be monitoring attendance. So you have a scale, and every attendance is probably, uh, from talking to state officials, like 10% of your overall right now, because the state doesn't uh, really know how they're going to utilize this chronic absenteeism. Um, but from my understanding, once it's in, and, and it's definitely in, and you'll see how we didn't score points and, and we lost points on our attendance here in Newburyport, um, that threshold of chronic absenteeism, I think is going to be the forefront. Because if you're looking at finding one bar across the entire state that you can measure, you can measure absenteeism in every school. Um, so this is one of them. So if you look at chronic absenteeism for the um, high school, so if you look up top, you get points of exceeded target is four points on this. So if you look up top, that first number is uh, on the left column, all students, that's the district. So the district for all students uh, received one point, which was no change. Um, when you look at the high school, uh, all students, they got two points. So the high school actually improved um, last year. And then if you look to the right, you, we have the lowest performing subgroup, you have a high needs subgroup, economically disadvantaged, and special education, okay? So if you look at special education as a subgroup for attendance, uh, they got no points, all right? So they actually decline when you start digging deeper into the data. We go to the next is uh, non-high school. Chronic absenteeism for non-high school students. 
So once again, the district level, we received uh, one point where no change. But when you break it down to the uh, individual school levels, lowest performing, you have NA. So there's not a subgroup there because they're really looking at third grade, right? For the developing the lowest performance. They don't have enough data to show lowest performance at the state level. Um, if you look at the BREZ, um, you have all students, uh, they got three points, okay? And if you look at the Mullen, they got three points. So they met their target, okay? At the NOC, you got zero points, okay? So there was a decline there. So remember that 144 students total? You only need 20 students in any school. So your school could be 900 students, and those 20 uh, is your subgroup, okay? So when you look at the NOC, some of those students that I showed you, uh, they're in sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. Um, and some of those other students, uh, more of those students are at the high school. So for here, you can see that um, when, you, when you're looking at the schools per level, you can see the points of decline or no change um, overall. So we looked, and I added that those last two there. So, the, so this is when you start looking at Friday early release. Um, and you're looking at the first one was right before, um, I think that was Columbus Day. So this is this year's data, uh, the, what I have right now. So right before Columbus Day was around uh, over 200 students that were absent on that day. And then when you look at the, the next day, um, I put in the early release for Thanksgiving, um, which is every year, um, that's, you're gonna have a high absenteeism on that day. But I added, I just got the data today, and I added the uh, before the vacation on 12-21, we had 179 students absent. And then uh, before the Martin Luther King <coughs> holiday, 118, 19, I just put a little box up there. Um, that was uh, 225. So we're gonna have more data when we look at the February vacation and the other vacation times on the Friday absences. Um, but then I went back. Question. Yeah. So is that was that for grades uh, one to twelve, or was yeah, that? That's, yeah, that's that was 12. the whole. Okay. The whole uh, school system. I mean, but not, yeah. but not pre K and K. No, I, I actually not uh, for the right. whole school system. It was there, but when you look at the breakdown, you look at the high school and the middle school and some of the grades where your attendance is going to count. Uh, that's some high uh, high okay. rates there. So what I did was um, I pulled the data uh, from last year on the Fridays. This was not um, before the vacations. These were just the Fridays. Because you have this year's data is the Fridays before vacation and long weekends. And then last year's data is Fridays. Um, and kind of seeing, you can see um, how it, you, you have the high percentages here. Um, and I can just, I don't think I put, I don't think you can see those numbers there, but I'll just, I'll just show you. You can just see that they're high um, numbers when you're looking at the Fridays. <clears throat> so last year, um, in September, we had 97, the first uh, day you had your 97 uh, students on 10-6. Uh, which was another just a Friday, it was 141. Thanksgiving, you're always around, it's usually around 300, and that's probably throughout the Commonwealth, you know, the Wednesday before Thanksgiving. So I don't, I put that on there, but I'm not considering that as, as a um, PD day. On 12-8 Friday, uh, this one here, I don't know if I can, I can't show you that, it was 108. Um, and then on December, we had 238 students. Um, the January was 147. Uh, the February last year was 293. Um, April was 302. Um, May was 101. And um, June was 82. Do you so, know, do, 
Yeah. Do you know when, when was graduation last year? I'm not sure. May something? No. 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 Graduation is always the first week of June. So it was the yeah. third. The seniors out before that Friday? They could have been, yeah. 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 So, because I know that on the, on the one, it might have been the Columbus, <coughs> and a third of the absentee kids were seniors. So it was on the, the, if, on the, on I th- the, I think uh, the fifth, I forget if that's right, but it was one of the dates was, it was 300 total, but that included pre K and K. Uh, but yeah. 100 and change were 12th graders yeah. on that one day. Um, yeah. I'm wondering how many are not going to be at school tomorrow because of the parade. Yeah. So it's going to be a big day. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, but I think that going back to attendance, I think that that's a very important piece mm-hmm. for our community to know. Like, as a, as a parent, <coughs> I think the community really needs to understand we're going to be measured on attendance. And that's going to be right now part of our accountability. So it's it's important, I think, overall for us to kind of work together through this. And I'll just I'll kind of come up with some of the the changes and some of the conversations that that we've had. And then I'll tell you what I would recommend to, to vote on tonight. And then you know we can kind of take a look. So uh, working through the contract, and, and there's some contract language. But I think the, the big vote for the school committee uh, and for parents is we're going to uh, recommend that we start after Labor Day. So I think that that's an important piece. So the first day of school would be that September 3rd. Um, Labor Day is on September 2nd. The other piece, too, is remember that I've been working with parents in the community and getting feedback. And this was uh, working with Assistant Superintendent Vic and myself, and I think this is something that might work. Um, taking that Wednesday, which is a back on the 3rd, taking that Wednesday, September 4th, and moving that full day PD there, I think it does two things. It one, uh, allows the teachers to really prep for their uh, students that are coming in uh, to, you know, for the next day, so they can look at 504s, they can look at IEPs, we can uh, collaborate and have teachers working in you know, grade level teams, departments, and really just really, really getting ready, student focused on this day. The other piece that's really nice in the work that the Knox's doing and um, that the high school is doing right now with their leadership, student led transitions, uh, really looking at those grade three families that are moving to grade four, um, and grades five families moving to grade six, and grade eight families moving to grade nine to have uh, student-led orientations that day. And I know they do orientations uh, in the summer, and and we did a lot of that work ourselves, but we felt if you could bring that class in, uh, the freshmen, and have the whole school to themselves, and have student-led orientation programs, it just makes that transition anxiety. It addresses a lot of of the new school issues. and the principals were on board and they thought that would be great. The Brez, uh, working with those principals, it would probably look a little bit different. You wouldn't have, you know, uh, student-led orientation in that type of sense, but it could be some of that transition uh, for the Brez. The Tuesday, November 5th, that's an election day. I would recommend we keep an early release on that day. Um, so that kind of compromises uh, having the ability of having some PD, but also uh, having the ability to also work with some other districts too. Um, and that, that would be you know, a recommendation. When you look at the data for the uh, Friday before uh, Martin Luther King Day, and I looked at that for like three years, that's a big attendance day, and I think on the half a day uh, PD, I think a lot of people take advantage of uh, the winter and they go skiing and things like that. It's a, a big community. Yeah. I would recommend taking that full day and putting it on the Friday. So you, you almost uh, deal with two issues. One, you're not dealing with high attendance on one of those Fridays. Uh, and two, the teachers can have some time to collaborate. Um, so that would be one recommendation of taking the full PD day. The other piece too, and listening uh, to a lot of the stakeholders uh, throughout the district, from the students uh, to school committee uh, 
member Sean Reardon. Um, really, if you're looking at you know, the idea, and it was brought up, I think, at a school committee, what about the Good Friday? Um, and we're working with ASME, the union, and really taking that Good Friday and making that a half a day. So you kind of gain the day uh, back. Um, so instead of getting out on the 18th, the students would get out on the 17th, and then the teachers do come back in on the 18th. But that also buys you uh, a few days if we have to have snow um, um, there. And then uh, I would recommend going into next year that we move the early release days of back away from the long weekends in the vacations. I would uh, recommend if you look at that option five, we keep them on Fridays, then we have another year of data, you have three years of data, really looking at the Friday early releases. Um, and then I think we'll be able to make a, a real informed decision as a community as we move into PD the following year. So but what I would recommend, because you've had like five different calendars, I would recommend that you vote uh, on letting everyone know we're starting after Labor Day. Um, you have these days here as almost like a first reading um, and then we can come back at our next meeting um, and then you know, problem solve if, if there's more uh, issues that arise with calendar five. But I think from listening to, to uh, students, parents, teachers, uh, this community, I think this, uh, bringing this forward and, and working on some of these uh, adjustments I, I think will work for us. Um, and then we all focus as a community looking at next year. Um, and so that's that's my overall. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, this is so. This is what it would look like. So you have on the left is this is the non-early release PD days. These are like some of the big days. Um, so on the right is what we have current in the yellow, and then on the left. So it's everything I just talked through, and it's kind of all right there. Um, moving that full day PD, which was in November. Bring that in September 4th, and teachers really get to focus on students in the classes as they prep uh, for the students to return. Um, the September 5th, students will all return to school. The full day PD that was in the spring, we bump it up a little bit on Friday and talk into the high school. That's right before uh, midterms, so we give the uh, teachers time to collaborate on their common assessments. Um, and then it would also give us time to check in um, and really focus on the second half of the year. Early release is the 27th, and on the left, uh, half day for the students' last day of school, and then teachers' last day. And then this is this the change of um, teachers taking the Fridays, as you can see. The only one that would not be on a Friday um, is the obviously the Thanksgiving, oh, is that the same one? Oh, I'm sorry. So it's really, um, sorry about that. Really taking those Fridays um, and moving them away from the PT. I mean, moving them away from long weekends in the vacation. So that's what I have. So you're saying that you're saying that we only vote on the Start date and I would uh, recommend uh, because our, our next um, at our next school committee meeting, you get close to um, as a district and working with the union um, a date of you know are we starting before or after Labor Day. So I would I would take that up tonight. Um, leave the other stuff till next. And week. then leave the other stuff for a second reading or. Uh, time to kind of take a look at that. And um, I had talked to Bruce earlier. I have a question because you're in the middle of negotiations. And I know there's some stuff you can't talk about, but you know we have the same argument every year about before or after Labor Day. Um, some people always want, some people want sure. different people here, some different things. Right. Can we try and make it so, however this is worded, policy, however you want to word it, that if Labor Day falls on the first, second, or third, we have post Labor Day. If it's four, five, or six, it's pre. 
and then everybody knows what's going on. Everybody kind of gets what they want sometimes, and we don't have the same conversation sure. all the time. I think that that's a right. I think that's a, a great point. Can you do that? And I mean, is that part of the negotiation type of thing? You can put well, it's a, it's how does a, that work? There's some dates that's already articulated in the contract. Yeah. But I think it's a general. Um, under, I agree with you. I think it's as as we move forward, developing the calendar as a team here. Um, I think that that ends up becoming common knowledge. Like, here are the dates. This is what, um, you know, when we start at Labor Day, when we don't start at Labor Day. And then if we were ever going to change or make an adjustment, it would be working in a collaborative manner with teachers. Um, so right now there is contractual language that's already built in into that contract. But, you know, listening and working with the union, um, remember, I've been, I've been here for a short time. Um, we have great teachers. We're developing uh, strong relationships right now. And really, the number one people in the professional development is the teachers. And I think that that's a very important stakeholder to bring to the table. Um, and I foresee as we move forward in calendar development as a community that the teachers will be uh, really involved in the process too. Because they, they have great suggestions like all of us, and it's really bringing people together and making what's the best plan for professional development and the plan for the staff and the students that we really, it's gonna benefit everybody, so. Does anybody have, Sean, sure, do you wanna take some feedback on sure. some of the ideas you propose? Does anybody have feedback that they wanna give at this point? Kind of, kind of David. Go ahead, that. you can go around the table, um, That was great information, thank you, so I don't want to, Seem like I'm attacking anybody, but the Friday thing, when we got the comparisons between regular Fridays and ER, no matter how you did the math, if you dropped the highs and lows or took the 2016 17, which we had some, for some reason a, um, a Friday half day instead of a Thursday, but that made that nine days to divide instead of eight, it's really like an average of 12 extra people ditching school on an ER day. And we had Thursdays, the Fridays also had a high absentee rate. So the district doesn't have a problem with early release skipping school. It's a, a whole a Friday entirely type of thing. Mm -hmm. So I just, I don't, th in regards to what the state says, I don't think it's as big of a problem as 12 more on average kids than on a normal Friday in October. Um, it's. It's not, and, and you know, I've never big, been a big fan of like the teachers who like punish the whole class because one kid's misbehaving. And if those twelve families are going to be trying to take advantage of the system, you know, why throw everybody else under the bus? Right, and and I think that you know, as we're looking at this year and looking at Fridays, um, and that's why the recommendation for me to to all of you is, we're not going to take the Fridays out this year we'll have right well but we'll have another year of data we'll have i'm as i said i'm coming into the system mm -hmm. i ended i'm starting to understand some of the issues and concerns from all the different stakeholders and really just bringing people together and figuring out together what's the best uh role of pd so i think for my recommendation going into next year is keeping the pd on fridays Right, except for that one, I, we need that Tuesday in November. Uh, gives us another year of data, but I would not back them up against vacation and long weekends right now. Um, just one quick thing, I know Joe wants something. The Tuesday in November, because <laughs> we talked about this so much. Right. It, it's like a handful of teachers who go outside the district. To well, do I think it's a, I agree, like I think, Here's the difference is we, we have, I think, some uh, comprehensive professional development that we're doing. Yep. And when we're, we're gonna start looking at uh, skills-based instruction, we're gonna start looking at uh, technology, and there are some local schools that uh, I would personally, that I personally believe that if our teachers could collaborate with, would really be beneficial. Cause so it's a Far further districts because none of the ones directly around here have the Tuesday off anymore. Yeah, well, right? yeah, there's a few. There's a I few. mean, Pawtucket, Triton. I mean, the ones close to us. No, no, no. no. Do. Triton doesn't. Yeah, I'm looking at the Triton doesn't, but Pawtucket does. Mm -hmm. Now we have some targeted schools we'd like to work with. Yeah. But Tuesday is tough. Just it's a Tuesday. You know, you come back to school Monday, and now you got to find something to do with your kid on a Tuesday when 
nobody has the day off of work. I, I well, had, Bruce seems to think that eventually we're going to have election day off as a holiday, so federal holiday. So. <laughs> yeah, it's been proposed. It's, 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 it's a bill in the yeah. Senate right now. Mm -hmm. Making a half day is worse than keeping um, it. No, no, no. Yeah. It's better as a half okay. day, but right. it's just weird that it's Tuesday no. instead of a Monday or a Friday or right. whatever. You know? Right, but you're kidding. It's yeah. an anomaly because yeah. there's, there's some schools that school districts we like to partner with a little bit. And, so, you know, some of the partnership <clears throat> stuff is us going out and looking at other schools, and some of it is having those staff come in here. Mm -hmm. So if they, you know, if they have it off, for example, the Billy Donegan training, we're using staff from another district who have implemented what she did, um, and they're they're participating as trainers, right? Mm -hmm. So let's do it the day before Thanksgiving. What's that? Staff day. Keep the kids home because they don't come anyway. No, you couldn't. Do that. <laughs> I used to do it when we when I worked in Maine. We had the Monday, Tuesday, and half day Wednesday as staff days. Kids had the whole week off. Oh, yeah. Can I week off? We can do anything, right? Mm -hmm. I'll be honest with you. I am. I'm confused by all the different calendars. That's why I so sent that I. text today. Like, can you print these out so I can have them sure. in color, like looking at them? Because there's there's just a lot of different things going on, right? And the changes between them all. So I'm trying to. I'm trying to remember what's what. Mm -hmm. um, the couple things I know is that I really, I really dislike broken weeks, which is why we moved the Fridays where we backed them up to the vacations, because as a teacher, student, and parent, chopping the calendar up um, makes it, I think, most difficult. I think that's the least advantageous learning. And so the, the amount of things we learn might not be as uh, easily definable as the days absent, but I think that the culture of learning takes a hit when we continue to chop up the calendar by having broken weeks. And I always felt that as a teacher, and I felt that as a student, and now as a parent, my kids are like, oh, whatever, you know, three and a half day week, yada, yada, yada. So that's, that's originally why we moved them, why we backed them up to try to keep some consistency, some full five day weeks, because there's always something in school going on when the, when the days are broken up. Um, so I struggle with that. <laughs> I don't know how to do it because I, I, I personally can't do it, but as far as the data on the, the kids, on our chronic absentee kids, I would be really curious if the kids or parents or families who took advantage of the half days and took a full day off, are those the families that are actually missing 18 days in a year? I think he... he there's a couple of things. Number one, I think when you're looking at professional development, um, I'm a firm believer that uh, having continuous professional development throughout the year really can benefit. Yeah. I'm not uh, questioning that. No, no, so, what I'm saying yeah. is so it can benefit. So you have nine and a half professional development days. When, when we mention that to other districts, and I'm coming new from, another dis from other districts, uh, that's like... People can't believe oh, the teachers, uh, other teachers on the districts just really crave that. So I, I think that's one one point. Um, um, I think you, you, we need to look at our overall attendance um, as a district. So we're we're not at a 98 percentile, you know, for yearly attendance. We're um, in some grades uh, lower than others, but we're we're closer in some of the grades <laughs> to that 95 percentile, which for you know for us, I think overall attendance is an important important piece um, to really take a look at. And I think the proposal that we have on the floor, or I mean, you know, I, I think you decide on after Labor Day, um, but I think some of the options that are there, I think, is really a compromise of looking at the those Fridays. Um, it gives you another year of data, and then we can regroup. 
So I would also wonder, we've talked about this before, about what's going on on those Fridays, on those half days. Um, one year we looked at, although we didn't get to do a deep dive, like with staff attendance on those Fridays, because it wasn't great as a percentage. Um, what's that? I just want to add, yeah. we did look at that this year, yeah. and, and staff attendance stayed pretty consistent, whether it was Thursday or okay. Friday. I'm just, I'm just saying, like in the past, we've looked at a couple of things. So I'm, I mean, the big one to me is, are the people taking the ski vacation Martin Luther King weekend, are they really gone? Yeah, those are chronic absentee kids. I think so, there's a, I think there is a, I think there's a mixture so, of kids in there. That's all. I'm just trying to like we're trying to solve the problem of absenteeism, and chronic absenteeism specifically. And I don't know that we understand, or that I understand, because it's not it's not broken down. Like who are those kids who are missing all those days, and why are they missing all those days? And I'm not. I'm going to take a bet that it's not the half day, not that extra 60 kids who are out on a half day on before Martin Luther King Day, that that's not our issue. It's just knowing the soft uh, anecdotal evidence that, I'll, that I have in my own head, and it is soft and it is anecdotal, the chronic absentee kids are not that extra spike that we're talking about here. So I don't know that moving the days to another week and therefore chopping up the week and maybe taking away a vacation from a kid who could go and would only miss two days a year. Well, remember, it's when, when you're looking, I mean, I, I pulled every kid, yeah. to be honest. I have it right in my bag right here. Yeah. Um, so you're talking about 18 absences or more. If you wanted to take a look at the effects of absenteeism. So if you wanted to look at a number of 10 absences, then that number's gonna, you know, be yeah. even even more kids. But when you're looking, so the, the key is, it's not only you just look at attendance and say, oh, well, you take your attendance population. So students that are maybe missing six days out of the year, right? And then you start looking at your um, scores you can almost start to correlate high absenteeism, and not just the chronic ones, mm -hmm. high absenteeism with, um, um, how do I put this, um, success of the academics. You can start to correlate that. At, Maybe. Yes. Yeah. Well, I Maybe, think well, we'll I mean, you know, but that's another question I have, and I, I wrote that down, like, is there, can we show a correlation to parents that say, listen, we found in Newburyport that if you miss more than five days on average, your GPA goes down this much. Like, can we start talking to parents? Well, I, I think it's, yeah. I mean, I think it's, it's overall, you're looking at attendance, right? right? And I think overall, when you're looking at professional development, uh, we have um, in Newburyport coming into the district, you have nine, nine days of well, you know, half day PD, where it gives the teachers an opportunity to really collaborate, to check in, to do, you know, the time that, that is spent is very beneficial, which we all agree on. So we're looking at, the two years looking at Friday data, uh, Friday of last year, and then Friday bumped up to long weekends and holidays. So we're saying, all we're saying here is going into next year with a lot of these great questions you're asking, is it gives us more time to really dig deeper and look at you know Thursday, Friday, or do you keep them on Fridays? I'm not saying that we're going to Wednesdays and Thursdays. I'm just saying that to me, as superintendent, knowing that absenteeism has an effect on learning, you know? Um, Chronic, yes, that's these people that are way here, but ongoing absenteeism disrupts the learning. And I think it's something that the state is now gonna be measuring. They're gonna be looking at accountability. They're not only looking at the chronic absenteeism, but they're looking at that 98%. They'd like to have students in school 98 to 100% right in that ballpark. Um, but the districts that aren't meeting that criteria at a 95 or less, is like a red flag. And in some of our 
uh, as we're looking at absenteeism as a district, that's, you know, even if it isn't the PD or moving or, or changing things, absenteeism is something that we get a, as a district, we really uh, need to focus on because it is going to become, it already is at a, at a small point, uh, 10%, but all of the superintendents, all of the districts know that once they start to get more and more data on absenteeism, the ele elevated accountability is probably going to go up. So I think it's something that we, we need to deal with and, and talk about as a community. Good choice. I just had a question, like, so, Sean, before you got here, maybe Angela could speak to this. Did we have a system in place where, you know, once a kid is out eight times, you know, that's a red flag, and now we start working with those families? Yes. So do we have? We do. Okay. We do. We have systems in place at all of our schools around that. So once a student has missed a certain amount of time, there's always a phone call. There's usually um, some collaboration with the family to try to find out what's happening, what's preventing the child from getting to school, is it? Um, a more serious illness that mm -hmm. we need to be aware of, those kinds of things. Is there um, other supports the child needs to help get them there? Okay, so, so we've had those in place. Correct. Right. Mm -hmm. the, yeah. the difference is the state's now measuring that. So right. Far. Yeah. But, I mean, like I said, I was just curious. Yeah. yeah. Is this prompting us to, like, all right, you know, we got to start working with some of those families who have kids who are oh, chronically yeah, out. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, Sean, is it possible um, to, um, look at the data in ways that Dave is suggesting um, for the next year, certainly, um, to, to see what we can correlate. Um, can we cut the data so we can look at that? Sure. Um, and, then, and then have an informed discussion about who those kids are and what impact that has on professional development, what impact that has. So we can get at that information. I feel like we're kind of conflating issues. Like, I'm not questioning the value of the professional development nor, you know, more kind of curious as to what's actually going to happen with the state. I'll be honest with you, so far, every couple of years, the state changes their data system. So, you know, in two years, who knows what they're actually going to be looking at and what they're going to be measuring it by. Um, so I, I try to focus on, you know, what are we talking about now for our kids here? Mm -hmm. um, so I just don't want to mix all that stuff up. And then if there are kids who really need help getting to school, what is that? Versus if, you know, if there's, people going on ski vacations that need a little heads up, boys and girls. How do we do that? So, I guess I have a, a feeling that while I recognize the importance of attendance, tracking attendance, and how we need to correlate that attendance to academic achievement, I think that's very important. I am wondering whether, as we take a look at the calendar as a way to solving our attendance issues, we are not trying to apply a solution in search of a problem. Do we really know that most of our attendance issues happen around professional development? Or are there other days, other times that we have peaks and, and uh, uh, kids missing school. It could be, you know, in the winter, the third week in February, we always <coughs> seem to have a flu attack at the middle school and we have mm -hmm. X number of kids out. I don't know right now, and I, I haven't seen evidence that PD time is necessarily affecting our attendance loads. I guess that's part of what I would be looking for. So having said that, I come back to the calendar that you're asking us to vote on, or to vote on at least for the start date. Can you explain to me why it is you suggest that we vote just on the start date and not on the full calendar today? Um, according to the contract, um, there's language in there that teachers need to know by February 28th of a start before or after. And I've got no problem with that. I, I, I want to know why it is that we're saying, okay, if we're going to vote on the start date, is there any reason why we shouldn't vote on the whole calendar today? 
I would love for you to pull on the whole calendar today. But it all depends on some of those. Uh, calendar five, there's some, um, there's some of those days that we still need to solidify. You know, the MOU so, with Ask Me, um, and some of those days we're looking to move. So we don't have the data to, to we don't have the. You don't have that, absolutely. Right. This is, okay. yeah. Yeah. That's, and that's and, the, and the, the reason for the MOU is that's because that's a, not a day that they usually work. They're Correct. now going to be coming into work. We're going to be giving them time someday. Yeah, well, so Correct. I understand that. But I that, just wanted to understand why yeah. we couldn't go ahead and vote on the full calendar today. Mr. Sean, have you thought about after Labor Day and moving those two days? I'm just looking, ironically, they, everyone was saying we want the, the coming in for a couple days before Labor Day seems silly. So now we're coming after day, but we still have just two days, that Thursday and Friday. Like, is there a reason why you moved the staff to after Labor Day too? Because just, I think from my entry plan and, you know, getting a lot of information from parents and talking to teachers, um, bringing that day um, up with the teachers, I think is, I mean, the other piece is we, we're working on developing, I think, uh, uh, a calendar that's going to support teaching and learning and also, um, so you take that in consideration. So one of the important feedback uh, that I received from parents was the transitions, you know, grades three to four, grades five to six, and um, grades eight to nine. This allows another day for that transition. So the teachers are back. We do a lot of our mandated training on the first day. The second day, uh, we do the student-led transition. <laughs> And then that gives our teachers and the teaching staff another day uh, to prep for the students that are going to be in front of them in the sense of uh, the, the 504s, the IEPs, the uh, updated team uh, goals. I think it's a, it's a great day to really focus on the teaching and learning uh, for teachers. So when all the students now come back, so your grades uh, you know, three to four, five to six, eight to nine, those students um, have the school to themselves, they, that transition went smoothly, and then when everyone comes back, um, it's a great day. Did that in, uh, as a building principal for 10 years, and uh, our freshman transition from eighth to ninth grade um, was, was awesome, it was the best day for the kids. And I, working with teachers and, and the administration, that was kind of our focus. But you're saying if we voted on this, there's that ask me thing is not set in stone, so we could vote yes on this, and then that may not happen. Um, well, I'm I'm going to ask you to vote on after the Labor Day stuff. That's what I mean. Right? Yeah. If we did the whole thing, that could fall through, and then this would it's be. It's not locked in. It's not locked in. It, that, in the that's why, yeah. That's so. That's why that's you just. Yeah. We just got to get an official. We did a lot of uh, work uh, with them, and it's just. Um, yeah. sign sealed and delivered. Yeah, and there's some other things um, that we're looking at too for the specific days. All right. So if that's the thing, can we do? A, how do we do this? Could we do a motion to vote on the start date? Uh, make, make, yeah. I would say make a motion to vote that we um, we agree that we're going to be starting school after Labor Day. So it's a post Labor Day start. Um, that that would be the motion. Is that so moved. moved. Do we have a second? Second. All right, we can continue discussion. Um, so we're not voting on the calendar per se, because we, we, there's still some things that need to fall into place if we would adopt draft five. But um, Sean has presented some of these ideas that he's thinking about for now and essentially saying, not really significant changes till next year. We're gonna gather data. We're gonna take a deeper dive in that data to uh, answer some of the questions that Dave raised. So the 26th is when we would talk about the fine details and stuff? Yeah, I think we would probably vote the calendar up or down on, on the 26th. Right? Yeah. yeah. Go ahead, Dave. I also have to feel that days at the beginning of the year are more valuable than days at the end, especially for I guess it would be K-8, 
kids who don't have final exams. My experience of days at the end of June in those schools are just the kind of vacuum of activities to get us through the time. And I don't know how else to say it any other than that. And that's not a reflection on Newburyport, it's just, just a reality. Um, and I'll tell you that if we do go that late into the 23rd or 4th of, of June, there are a lot of sleepaway camps. Kids are gonna miss three days there at the end of the, the, end of the year just because, because that's when camps start. And so again, if we're talking about attendance and trying to predict what people will blow it off for, um, I know of a number of very popular sleepaway camps in the area. They all start the week before July 4th. Kids will not be here. And so I'm continually nervous, both for academic reasons, you know, and I think as we saw tonight in the public comments, some families will always want post Labor Day, some families will always want pre-Labor Day, and, and I don't think we're gonna win one way or the other. I mean, Brian's compromise isn't a bad one because everyone gets what they want, but I think if we look at the academics, I think days at the beginning of the year are more valuable. I know when I used to teach high school, um, you bring any AP teachers in here, they're gonna beg you for days in August versus days in June because that's the way AP teachers think. Um, well, you have to cover the material by then too, you know? But the rest, so the, the AP tests happen on the same day across the country. And so if we're starting, every day that we wait to start is another day that they don't have. Mm -hmm. that, that's all I'm saying is, that's how AP teachers right. think. So I know it doesn't matter everywhere, but anytime I put my what's best for academics hat on, I don't think it's after Labor Day. And whether or not some families want it before or after, we can, you know, we can vote to sway our opinion that way. I know there are weather trends too, but those are weather trends. It's 60 degrees tomorrow in February. We could have a, we could have a Sunday tomorrow, Sean. You could really be the most popular superintendent <laughs> ever. <you know? laughs> I declare soccer day tomorrow in Newburyport. <laughs> um, you know, so that's why I'm like, uh, I'm, I'm still reticent about a post Labor Day start because I haven't heard anything other than we kind of like it that way. Well, no, I think that is. So that was my question. Is, do you have this any? contractual language regarding the start of the school day before and after Labor Day? So is this is this a moot conversation? You're saying there's contractual language that we're supposed to start it one way or the other? In the existing in the existing in the contract. existing contract, we have to notify the teachers by February 28th. I understand that, but I'm saying when we vote tonight to let them know. Yes. This contractual language on start time of when you start. Yes. So why are we voting on it? Because we, we need to let both teachers know. Because I think there's language in there that says if you could change it, but you just have to let them know. Correct. Right? Oh, okay. That's why I was confused there. I thought, Correct. So that's what I'm trying to figure out. Is there any other reason, is there any reason that, that we're thinking about starting? I just listed off a couple that I think are valid reasons to start before Labor Day. I'm asking you if there are any reasons other than there are a number of families who want it that way. No, I think, start after I think, I think it, when you go back to the history of Newburyport, when you talk to... Um, other districts, I think when Labor Day falls early, like it does in this scenario, September 2nd, um, many districts feel um, that, you know, you start after Labor Day. And there's contractual language within our existing contract that also uh, articulates that. So when you're looking at uh, September 4th or 5th or 6th, then, you know, there's there's more of a, in my opinion, there's more of a decision to be made mm -hmm. for the community. But September 2nd, um, to me, is a, is a very early Labor Day. Um, it's probably gonna be one of the earliest as I went back and looked at the calendar over the years uh, for a long time. Um, and with some of these other, I mean, there's a lot of work that's gone into this. This isn't like something, you know, working with the unions and, and working uh, with AFSCME and 
trying to move some things around to I think um, I think everything's fallen into place that we're addressing a lot of the issues and the concerns. I think as we move forward as a community, this this discussion and we'll have you know more input from the teachers, I think the next time, but you take a look at that. So when it does fall on a on the September fourth, um, some people go before the Labor Day because you're not going to have. So I think that for us as a community, um, you know, we got to, I think down the road I foresee myself working with a lot of different people. So we're not really debating this at this time. I think we'll really have uh, a general understanding, you know, what, what we're going to do. My, my uh, what I really would like to see is another year of data on the Fridays because you really only have two years. You have the before the long, uh, the, the Fridays of PD uh, without long weekends and um, holidays and the vacations. And then you have Fridays before the long weekends and vacations. And so my recommendation would, as I said, once we get everything else into place is keep them on Fridays. It gives us three years of data. It also gives us more information to look at um, how the state's calculating uh, chronic absenteeism and calculating attendance for everybody. I just think we need a little bit more time uh, to kind of take a look at everything. Um, <clears throat> Dave, um, one of the concerns that you raised had to do with camps in the last week of June. Um, and <clears throat> this particular calendar that we're going to be voting on, um, July 4th is on a Saturday. So that entire week is already scheduled to be off. That Isn't the contract that the teachers can't work after June 30th, no matter how many snow days we have? So, and I agree with Dave, the academic thing, but the last two weeks of school, Labor Day is an arbitrary date anyway to pick when school starts. So if you shifted it two weeks earlier, or it's still gonna be the last two weeks of school and kids not really doing a whole heck of a lot in the lower grades at least. I don't know if it's the, the date you're up against though is it's the end of the MCAS bracket. So MCAS testing ends in May. And the longer the, the more science is in June. Science is in June. Right, High so school. in June. So the Right, so and the more time you have after those tests, grades three through eight, they're done. And so there may be some places, and I hope there are a lot of places, where teachers have found a creative, engaging way to keep, keep things rolling. Well, I guess that's one of the things you have to do then, right? I think that's, I mean, I, that's, you know, that sort of goes to the heart of the professional development that we're actually providing. That, 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 I think the way teachers teach is going to change here. And I think that that's going to, I do think that that's going to have the impact. That's all I'm saying. I'm, I'm, again, I'm not knocking Newburyport. I'm not saying anything about any particular teachers. I've just found in my experience, beginning of the year, it's more valuable to teaching and learning than the end of the year. I would agree. Yeah. And, and that's why seniors don't even go at the end of the year. We, we yeah. let them go. <laughs> like, <laughs> and given that point, I think that becomes a challenge, or not a challenge, but an objective for us as a group to make sure we make those days count and make sure everyone's working together to do that. Right. And if I can also add, I liked what Mr. Callahan said about September 1st, 2nd, and 3rd. If that's, uh, if that's how the calendar falls, then start, start school after Labor Day. Uh, because honestly, we've had a lot of rich discussion here, but I also think we could put that discussion into other things that have a lot of importance. So, uh, and again, I, but it's, it's important that we do our work and everyone gets heard, and, uh, but it's also important that we're able to tackle some of those stronger issues. I just had one other question too, regarding the whole absentee, and I guess I'm a little uncomfortable with how privacy comes into this. Yeah, I agree. And for, mm -hmm. and you know, targeting, you know, uh, you know, kids with absences or bringing up families. Uh, I, I just think that, I guess I don't find that appropriate. I think that, no, that, I, yeah. that and, and again, I'm not looking to, and also if I can say, and I'm not trying to criticize any, any statements, but if we're worried about ski weekends or if we're worried about sleeper camps, tonight when they proposed the sailboat thing, we asked about 
what do you do for kids who can't afford them? You know, not everyone's going to be able to afford a ski trip. Not everyone's going to be able to afford a sleepover camp. So who are we making decisions for, you know? And I think we need to keep that in mind that this is public education and we need to try to treat everybody the same. Any further discussion? I'll call the question. All those in favor of starting after Labor Day, say aye. 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 Opposed? There are none opposed. We will look to vote on the, cal on the calendar on, on, uh, on the 26th, Six, I think, 26th. Good, and we will have more information for you then. Mm -hmm. Terrific. Um, thank you. Assistant Superintendent Report. Okay, speaking of professional development, <laughs> um, we've just finished our uh, first cohort in the skill-based learning and teaching um, course with Billy Donegan and our two coaches, Stephanie and Jane, who worked alongside um, Billy throughout the nine days. We had, um, we had a total of j just about 60 teachers involved in this professional development. And um, our, we had an elementary cohort, a middle school cohort, and then we had a combination of, uh, I mean, middle school and high school combination and then a high school cohort. And uh, the teachers, uh, I think, were very excited to have three full days that they could focus on drilling deep into their practice in developing this skills-based unit. Um, we had a debrief today that was um, really nice. There were uh, a lot of comments that came from it. Before Billy finished with each group of teachers, she asked, what are you most excited about? And then she met with the administrative team today and asked the same questions. And the answers were, were similar. You know, people were, there was a renewed enthusiasm about their teaching practice, um, looking at things mm -hmm. with a new lens. I had a teacher who said to me that they knew where they wanted to go, but it was sort of like climbing a mountain and they were paralyzed by the size of it. And um, having the three days got them moving on their journey of where they wanted to go. So I think that it was very positive, but it's the beginning. You know, these are the very first steps. So we talked about how to sustain the work, um, how to move into cohort two. Um, when Billy came and talked with the school committee um, a couple of weeks ago, she talked about that viral effect. And um, so all of the teachers that were involved this time developed a skills-based unit that they'll be implementing before the year's out and um, we're gonna provide them the time they need to do that work, the coaching, to help them along the way. And Billy's going to continue to work with our leadership team so that we can get as good as we can get um, in providing the teachers the supports that they need and the structures to make this, this work. I think one of the most exciting things about the work um, for me is that this really moves us to student-centered teaching and learning. Um, and um, we started some other work today that's in line with that um, through the Center for Secondary School Redesign. And um, they are working with our middle school and high school. And um, over the next several days, Excuse me, I just want to pull up my sheet. They started today, and the approach today was a student forum. So there were about um, 30 sixth grade through 12th grade students, um, kind of a cross section of our student body. And those students went through an exercise with facilitators today where um, they chose an artifact that they thought represented the Newburyport Public Schools to them. And they had some time to, to talk about that artifact and what it meant to them. And um, then they got some, um, some um, lessons around deeper learning and what deeper learning really looks like. And they had an opportunity to talk about what they would like to see their schools be. And so that was an exciting first day for them. 
And then um, tomorrow, the teachers are going to do student shadowing. So there were, for example, 12 of those students were middle school students. So there will be teachers shadowing those 12 students who were in the student forum today. And the, the shadowing is pretty interesting because they're going to do everything the student does the entire day. So they go to lunch with the student. They get, don't get to go to lunch someplace else. They have lunch with the student. If the student has to ask for a bathroom pass to use the bathroom, the teacher who's shadowing them, they really live the life of the student for the day. And it's to help our teachers better understand the perspective of what a day is like in the lens of a student. We have um, high school teachers that will be doing the same on, um, on the 7th, so middle school is tomorrow, high school will be on Thursday, and then there's a reflection day on the 8th where they come together and they talk about what that experience was and um, make some plans for moving forward now that we have a better perspective um, around what a student, a day in the life of a student is. And we've had the opportunity to hear from our students who reported out after their student forum. So, both of these learning experiences really marry together nicely in helping us move to student-centered practices in our schools. So that's all very exciting. Um, and I think there's been really good energy. I walked into the room the one day during the workshop with Billy, and the buzz was electric. You know, when you go into a room and people are so excited about what's happening and there's just a buzz to the room, it was, um, it was, it was really impressive. Certainly, um, I had a chance to go over there with Sean. Sean invited me to join the teachers for lunch. Yeah. So I can tell you that whatever this work is, it's making the teachers very hungry. <laughs> when we got there, there was nothing <laughs> left. We had our salad. It was sad. I had some salad. You know, mental, mental energy oh, yeah. burns a lot of calories. <laughs> yeah. But they were, the teachers came up to me and were very excited about what they were learning. Yeah. Um, it's great. Yeah, it was really terrific. To see. We're really looking forward to see those units be, be implemented and be in the classrooms and have an opportunity to talk to the students about their learning. So, um, I had a couple of other things I wanted to share with you. We had um, last week we held our first cross district ELL meeting for the last couple of years. I think I've been talking to you about trying to move towards more regional work with some of the other low incidence districts in the area. So um, we had representatives from Amesbury and Pentucket in Newburyport at our cross district um, ELL meeting and we focused on several things. Um, we focused on the uh, ELL camp that we're going to run again in, during April vacation this year and we've expanded it to include students from Pentucket this year. Last year, if you remember, it was students from Amesbury and Newburyport and this year. We're including Pentucket. And Amesbury? We're, and Amesbury, yes. So there'll be three districts involved this year. But we're also, we also started the planning for cross-district parent evening, which um, we'll be holding in March, and um, ag across the three districts. And we talked about things like progress reports and how we're screening our ESL students, um, particularly our young students. Um, we talked about what kind of professional, what our professional development needs are and how we might be able to collaborate on those. Um, we talked about parent communication and what's working in the, in the different districts and what, what's not and how we can improve. Um, I think it was a really powerful meeting. Um, everybody felt that they got a lot from it and felt like there was a real need for this collaboration. So we're really excited about getting the ball rolling and um, moving forward with that. And then lastly, when um, Superintendent Gallagher put up the data little, uh, we caught my little cartoon. Yeah, the little cartoon thing earlier, it made me think about us in the district too because you just heard all of our data conversations. So you saw, you got a firsthand view of all the data that we're collecting on our students. And um, we are starting to work 
with a, um, a gentleman that's going to help us build an analytics platform using Google Suite. And I'm so excited about this. We have been looking for this kind of platform for years, and most of it is developed through software companies that, that control when you can add the data, who can add the data, when the data gets updated. Um, this, by using Google Suite, he creates a dashboard for your district. You decide what kind of data wants you want to put in there. Um, he sets up a system so that it emails teachers, their class rosters, they can enter their own data. It comes back into the uh, larger database that allows you to do analytics. So the thing that's so exciting about this is now we can start to look at not only our state data, but we can look at other standardized data as well as our local data all together and really um, get a better picture of what each individual student is doing. So this is, um, this is, is really exciting. And he's, he's a very interesting man who's done this work for a long time for banks and um, now he's branching out into schools and um, I think you'll be really excited. As soon as we get a sample, we're, we're working on kind of a prototype of what a dashboard would look like for Newburyport. We'll uh, be sure to share that with you. But we're getting that work underway too. So a lot of really good things <coughs> going on right now. Great. Any questions? Superintendent's report. All right. Um, yeah, and just going back to that dashboard, I think one of the uh, feedback we received from teachers is this type of data dashboard will, will be right there. So it's instantaneous, it's consistent, and teachers will be able to use this data to inform their instruction, which as we all know in education, that's the number one piece. Uh, live data that I can use immediately. Um, to assist our students. So I'm excited about that op um, opportunity too. Um, and just the other thing, tying in the Billy Donning work with exactly what Angela said with CSSR, um, the teacher um, shadow day is going to be very in in informative for our teachers. They're going to live the life of a Newburyport student, um, which then we go back and we start to really take a look at our curriculum instruction and assessment. Um, and it's, it's going to be awesome. So great things are happening in the district. So I think Assistant Superintendent Beck. Um, I just wanted to touch base on our retreat. I thought we had a, a great uh, school committee retreat. We checked in um, and we signed off. I mean, some of the, the business operations uh, signing off on um, kind of our rules and regulations there, but I think having discussions, uh, taking a break and really getting focused was very beneficial. Um, I think for all of us as a team, the school committee and the superintendency, so I appreciate that. I would recommend we maybe look at another one uh, down the road uh, in April at some point or even early May. Um, we'll be in the middle of a uh, budget season and we'll be able to have some conversations there um, and just uh, I've been uh, my entry plan and I know at the next school committee meeting we'll be focusing on the budget but just uh, the survey data the community uh, uh, being out in the community interviewing a lot of people I got an opportunity to work with the NOC students um, which was great I worked with a, a group of seventh grade sixth grade and eighth grade um, to gather their feedback and really asking those same essential questions. You know, what do they feel uh, are the strengths of our district? What areas of growth? What are our opportunities and what are our goals? That's been kind of the, the big focus. For some of the parents, I also asked uh, other information you'd like the superintendent to know. Um, taking all that, uh, the data and compiling it and it's already, you know, starting to formulate a little bit uh, with some some big big ticket items that I really believe tie to our strategic plan. Um, and I think that that's, that's a big piece. And I know um, some of the parents that were here tonight on Late Start, that's, uh, I think we're gonna develop a plan to uh, formulate, to bring people back to the table and, and to take a, a look at that because this was important to this uh, community in 2015. And 
you know, we'll continue to take a look at that. We'll take a look also um, at our social emotional supports is coming through, um, special education costs. Uh, there's, a, I think, a lot of um, the feedback I'm getting uh, from the community is really tied to the strategic plan. So it's, it's really not us developing this whole new plan. It's, I think, getting focused, uh, utilizing the strategic plan that was created by this community, and really focusing, uh, pulling out some uh, actionable goals and uh, accomplishing goals through that strategic plan. So um, when I present the entry plan findings, I think I'm gonna be addressing, uh, I think, a lot of the issues um, that people have been raising. So I'm, I'm excited about that, um, you know, as we move forward. The other piece too is uh, I know uh, Kyle Harshin um, is the user fees is, is something that people brought up I think in the last school committee. So we're looking at that. I know he's gonna be formulating a small committee to look at user fees and um, he has some ideas and he's gathering more information from other districts and how they uh, utilize their user fees equitable across the board. And I think I'll have some, uh, you know, uh, proposals moving forward. Sean, do you, do you know who's going to be composing that committee? You know? I think it's uh, Kyle and I think he's him and Mr. Wolf are, are grabbing some of the um, parents and parents. Okay, yeah, yeah. Let's, yeah. Good. I'd like to hear that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> what else do we have? I know what, I'm going to go quick here for you guys. The, um, the Crest Collaborative, um, I had my first meeting. Thank you, Bruce. You know, you were not the only school committee member there. There was many other school committee members. There were. No, no, I wasn't the only so, school committee No. Um, and that's a great partnership that we have and getting to work with other local superintendents, I think is gonna be a positive. Um, so we had our first meeting, uh, it went very well. Uh, and then monthly meetings and really looking at how Crest and how we all can really support our, our um, you know, social emotional initiatives along with special education and kind of doing it uh, in a productive way where you know that that's going to be one of the you know the governor's trying to address special education costs in his budget and I know a lot of the uh, local and state officials are looking at special education costs um, and that's also local superintendents in crest so um, Governor Baker's budget we've already presented uh, at our retreat I uh, communicated where we're at in our budget process. Um, we're finishing off our individual principal meetings uh, this week. Um, and then our next piece of our budget is to collaborate and meet as a leadership team to identify the priorities um, as we move forward with that. Um, we had a great, I had an opportunity to go to first grade art class in Kim Sol Solis. Solis. Salata? Salate. Salate. Yeah. There you go. Um, so it was part of uh, uh, a local artists coming in and working with the first grade students, and that was, I believe, sponsored by the uh, PTO of the Brez um, that helped facilitate that. Um, so that was a wonderful opportunity and really ties into what a high school students uh, experienced. And then at a first grade level, having um, a local artist come in and do an art lesson with the students, I think is what it's all about. And working with the NEF and the Business Coalition, that's really part of that vision of having the community partnerships really support the classroom on a day-to-day -day basis. So um, that was great to see. I was uh, glad to, to be invited to that. Um, I think that's... Oh, and I had the opportunity to tour with uh, Andy, the principal at the charter school. I went over there for uh, a couple hours and got to see the charter school, meet some of the Newburyport families that are there, the, the children. Um, and then him and I just brainstorming, um, you know, ideas on you know, professional development instruction, project-based learning. So um, I think him and I see eye to eye on, on a lot of those initiatives. So. Um, it's been great, you know, I, I'm excited. Um, the more, as I said, I'm out and about and uh, receiving input from this community, from the parents, 
um, from the business um, coalition and the NEF, all of these different stakeholders just provided me information, which really has been, I think, helping me formulate um, the entry plan and some of the things just from hearing we've already addressed. Um, in the sense of with CSSR coming in working with our teachers, Billy Donegan coming in working with the teachers. Um, so there's some of those successes right away, and then some of these other initiatives, these bigger initiatives, are going to take a little bit more planning. But um, I think we're going to get there. So I'm just uh, once again, you know, excited to be here. We had a great, great faculty administrators, and uh, I think <laughs> things are coming together. Mm -hmm. So. Kind of where we're at. Great. Thank you. Questions? Subcommittee reports. Uh, joint Ed met today. Um, and uh, we had a, a, a really nice conversation with the, um, the NEF uh, executive director. She talked about um, the money that they raised and how they've allocated it this year. Um, and Sean also gave a presentation on, on MCAS and ha had a real good discussion with them about. Um, similar to the one that he had with us here today about the evolution and uh, and what they're looking for now and what areas we need to focus on. Um, finance, which I think is meeting the 12th? Yeah, next meeting is the 12th. Policy. We're looking for our spring meeting coming up. Superintendent Evaluation Committee hasn't met, although we should actually probably constitute that and, and meet, start to meet. I will, I will take, undertake that. Anybody have any other business? I was just gonna say we had another negotiation session with the teachers that went really well, I think, especially the teacher president. Joey? No, <laughs> Joey said. <laughs> but it went very well. Yeah, it's very encouraging. I will take a motion to adjourn if there's. So moved. Second. So moved and a second. Sean and Brian. All those in favor? Aye. 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 I'm not even going to ask for anybody opposed. All right. Just once I'd like to see a, a dissenting vote. Just for the you can be that dissenting vote. I definitely don't. I don't know.